This is Josh Mansell. You're listening to Pixelated Audio, episode 100, featuring the music of Crash Bandicoot. Welcome back to Pixelated Audio, a video game music and retro gaming podcast featuring music from computers, consoles, and the arcades. We're your hosts, Brian, James, and Gene, and today we're going to be listening to some fantastic and extremely nostalgic soundtracks from the Crash Bandicoot series on the Sony PlayStation, along with series composer Josh Mansell. Mr. Mansell, thanks for joining us, and welcome to the show. Oh, you invited my dad? <laughs> that's a joke thanks for having me congratulations on the 100th episode yeah. oh yeah well, thanks thank you. Yeah. yeah so not only are we gonna be listening to crash bandicoot tunes with josh today but you know like you mentioned this is our 100th episode and not only that this is actually our four-year anniversary this month of doing the podcast so yeah a lot of milestones yeah. all in one well episode done. <laughs> well done yeah you know this has always been a fun hobby side project for us and uh, we hope to continue it for many more years and uh you know it's it's always going to be kind of our baby and uh we're really excited because you know as the show kind of progresses we kind of our our tastes kind of change but we always kind of come back to uh to certain soundtracks and to certain styles of music and i think today's soundtracks that we're going to be listening to just hit all of those nostalgic points so it's going to be a lot of fun to kind of go through it and right. listen to it crash bandicoot was big for me as a kid i was i was really into this so i, I when we decided to do this episode and then when brian told me that you agreed to be on i was like really really pumped because i mean th- this soundtrack it's when i started listening to it for this episode again it just was like a flash right back to being kid <laughs> again <laughs> yeah so uh that track that brought us in that was the title theme from crash bandicoot one this is uh, such such a fun, mm-hmm. energetic kind of goofy. Almost, um, I was saying to you guys earlier. I was saying this is this is really uh, like a Saturday morning cartoon kind yeah. of oh, kind yeah. of track. It has that like fun playfulness. Um, and I was saying how like the xylophone and and very like uh, percussion heavy reminded me of the the Saturday morning cartoon type style that you right. mentioned. And uh, this track in general just. Uh, it was one of the first ones that just brought me right back. It was like really hit, really hit hard for the nostalgia. I mean, you turn on the system, this is what you hear. So, uh, and I played a lot of Crash One compared to the other games. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I, I think same here. I mean, it's, it's not ones that I was as familiar with before the episode, but I was really liking what I was hearing, especially the mixes that you sent us. Yeah. So, Josh, tell us about this this first track, this intro theme to the Crash series. Well, um, let's see. Um, I don't have any real specific memories of of delivering that and having it approved, but I do remember what led up to it, which was um, I, de- I delivered four demos in February of 1996 after meeting with Universal Interactive and Naughty Dog, mm-hmm. and it's it, at that point in the in the in the development they were a little bit torn between wanting to do something really different and unexpected, a more ambient direction, and having to sort of adhere to what was, um, you know, more conventional back then, which was a little bit more of a chiptune-ish mm-hmm. um, right. sensibility. So I remember the first four things I turned in, two were really cartoony, and the other two were a little bit, I wouldn't, when I say ambient, I don't mean like, tangerine dream or the orb or anything like that i mean just sort of like more of like just sort of straight up you know soundscapes with a little bit of a repetitive thing but no real like um melodies or or hooks anywhere right um and i think i did post uh one of the demos for the theme song on my soundcloud page which actually ended up being part of the first jungle theme 
And oh, I had nice. Comple- cool. Completely forgotten about that until I posted, and people were like, "Oh, this is like you know what happens when you get to this part of the jungle." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, that's right." Anyway, <laughs> oh yeah, I knew that. Yeah. <clears throat> so, awesome. as far as you know, the the, the the kind of the weird thing about doing these um, theme songs for the Crash games is I I would usually do them pretty late in in the process, if not last. Oh, because, what, really? Yeah, because. Um, they would design the um, the opening title sequences last, so huh. that's why, you know, at least for Crash One and Crash Two, it's not really like the music isn't really thematic as such. Now, I I, I think I did deliver the themes for. I know we're trying to go um, chronologically here, but um, I, I believe with Crash Warped and Crash Team Racing, there was definitely like an effort to sort of like incorporate like a recurring theme Mm -hmm. and that's why you hear it in those but definitely not in crash one and definitely not in crash two so i actually don't remember too much about crash one it it, it, i think it came pretty easily uh when i listen to it now i can i I think i know what i'm referencing which is kind of kind of weird but there's a ray charles song that kind of has a little bit of that um that type of syncopation in the horn line Oh, okay. And I, I, it's not even really syncopated, but just that. So I, I was listening to some Ray Charles. I don't know when it was, like, like a year or two ago, and I was like, "Oh man, that's 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 where that's I got where, it. <laughs> that's where my subconscious pulled it from." And it, it, it sounds nothing like it. I don't even remember which song it is, but um, I was just like, "Oh, that's probably what I was thinking about." Anyway, awesome. awesome. Well, let's let's jump back a little bit. How did you get into music? Like your early kind of pre-career, and then that path into uh, you know making music as a career. Well, let's see. I started off playing piano when I was about seven or eight, and I took that pretty far by itself, I think for about three years. And then when I got into uh, later in elementary school, they offered, uh, you know, like a band orchestra type uh, class. Right. And, um, you you know, basically you could just learn an instrument for free as part of your music education, Mm -hmm, which is like not a given these days, but it was, you know way back when so um i actually didn't want to take an instrument but my mom said uh well why don't you take percussion because it'll help you with your rhythm on piano and i was just like eh, I don't, you know i was being a pain in the ass about it <laughs> um but you know then i relented it and realized that it was actually really fun and then within a couple of years after that i kind of kicked piano to the curb and um started doing percussion full-time Oh, wow. Okay. In so high school. I, I didn't realize you went the percussion route, but that makes sense because a lot of the soundtrack that you know we're going to be listening to is very percussion heavy and it has uh, you know, a very strong emphasis on that percussion line, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, definitely. Very much in, this, in the realm of percussionist rather than just a drummer. And I could hear that even in that first track. It's, it's got a lot of really intricate lines going on. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I kind of took it all the way. Like by, by high school, I was in the symphony band, the marching band, uh, playing drums for the, the vocal uh, group. You know, they did like show tunes and j- vocal jazz. And then I did the jazz band. And then I had my I had a punk band. Oh, my God. Um, you sound like it sounds like the exact path that I took, except I fizz- <laughs> fizzled out and never made it. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, that's, so, that's so awesome. Yeah, I was definitely um, equal opportunity percussion. I've, you know, and I still am. You know, I still play. In, I've been playing with the same band for roughly 20 years. And I'm right now. I'm surrounded by the same drums I was using in high school, and my vibraphone is right behind me, and my timpani are outside in the in the storage. Oh unit. my god! You're gonna have to send some pics of that over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, now, so how, so you're talking about what kind of led up to the career, but like, how did that translate? How did all this education and like uh, like you know learning uh, about different instruments and you know being jazz band, punk band, um, all this stuff translate into a career for you? Well. Um, I suppose up until college, I was really kind of just in performance mode, you know, just being part of the percussion section. Right. right. Um, and I think it was maybe my senior year, I took a guitar class in high school. Um, I had fulfilled my, my math requirements. So I was like, all right, I'm, I'm done with math. So I took a guitar class and my younger brother also played guitar. So that last year I sort of um, started finding my way around in, on guitar and I, th- I think throughout the years, I had sort of like been drawn back to piano, too. We still have the piano, and I actually have that same piano in my living room now, which my daughter takes lessons and plays. Oh, that's so cool. That's yeah, so cool. that's awesome. Yeah. So by the time I got to college, I knew that I wasn't really good enough to like be a professional, you know, orchestral percussionist. And I never really had. I mean, I, w- I was I was pretty good, but I wasn't definitely not like first chair, like Mr. Chops or whatever. Mm-hmm. 
So by the time I got to college, I kind of pushed music to the side a little bit. You know, I took like a, a theory class and I uh, all all if, if you were going to take any music class at all, you had to sing in the choir or the chorus. Um, so I did that. And then by my sophomore year, I started really getting back into it. And I, I that's when I sort of decided I would tr- see, see what uh, composing was like. Now, were games on your mind when kind of thinking about a career? Not at all. My history as a gamer really kind of goes back to, um, you know, elementary school. Like I was a arcade. That's like that, that was my version of, of being a gamer. It was mm-hmm. like going to the arcade and, you know, uh, you know, with a pocket full of quarters and playing Tempest. You know, that was that was my <laughs> that was my game, which awesome. had no soundtrack, by the way. <laughs> right, right. You know, and actually the other game that I was into had no soundtrack either, which is Pitfall, which is a um, oh, yeah. a, Atari huh. game. So yep. my two favorite games had no music. So there's some, <laughs> something interesting awesome. there. Awesome. Um, but I, you know, I, I was definitely too old to be like into Nintendo. And I remember going over to like one of my friend's house and watching the little brother play Nintendo, like in the, I don't know, mid to late eighties and being sort of like, Oh, so that's what video games are like now. But I, I definitely, it, it did, it did not stick with me. I was way more into like collecting records and, you know, playing in my punk band. That was mm-hmm. what I, what I was interested in. Nice. So anyway, college is when I started to, um, try out composing and i was also taking a, a studio class which kind of taught me the basics of you know recording and um you know how to get around on a on a moog synthesizer and it, it uh, my last year in college actually is when they brought in a computer and that's where i where i learned how to do midi sequencing that was the last year like i remember midi being like the big thing like if you took a music class there or if you were a music major there was always like a like a full-blown midi class that you had to take i remember setting up some of the labs and like they had like the m1 audio interface for the keyboards and all that stuff with a dongle on the back so you could pirate (laughs) the stuff (laughs) i remember that art school is the same way like if you were doing any type of fine art all that stuff they force you to take digital uh anything that was like the new stuff that was coming out so um, the hot new thing i tell everyone that if i was like a year older i wouldn't have had that in my education you know because i brought in that computer to the studio my senior year oh wow and we all just kind of looked at it like this little mac in the corner and the teacher was like oh this is how you're going to be making music in the future and we're all like ha yeah right yeah Yeah. Um, (laughs) so i really lucked out and i and i learned uh studio vision which is not made anymore but that's um you know one of the big things that got me um my gig at mutato was that i knew how to work studio vision which is what mark mothersbaugh was using at the time so Mm -hmm. so as we get into the other games we can kind of talk about more specific influences but as a kind of blanket overall like what type of influences drove you in writing the crash bandicoot's uh soundtracks um well the the first game definitely has a different flavor and there was definitely a different you know different references were being thrown at me for that first game um they definitely wanted it to have a more kind of ambient feel like i said before and it wasn't until we got to the hog wild le- uh, level that it was really appropriate that I write sort of a goofy, you know, tune to go with it. Right, right, right. Well, we'll, be, and, we'll be playing that track soon. Well, so. that's like a okay. ridiculous level and it's very like... Very taxing as it is. Well, and it just it stands <laughs> out. It like not only like sound wise, but visually and gameplay wise, it's, it, it was an interesting point in the game. I'm having a hard time focusing now because I'm singing it in my head. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Let's quickly uh, talk about Crash 1 so we can kind of get into some more of the music. Right. So Crash Bandicoot, if you're not familiar with the series, is a 3D platformer starring an anthropomorphic marsupial debuting on the Sony PlayStation on September 9th in 1996. For this episode, we're going to be focused on three titles that make up the Crash Bandicoot trilogy. Crash Bandicoot, Crash Bandicoot 2, Cortex Strikes Back, and Crash Bandicoot Warped. Right. Each of these titles were developed by Naughty Dog and published by Sony Computer Entertainment. So, Brian, why don't you tell us a little bit about Naughty Dog? Yeah. So, they were founded as Jam Software in 1984 by two high school students, Andy Gavin and Jason Rubin. Naughty Dog got its early beginnings on the Apple II with a game called Ski Crazed. And I, I checked this out. Oh, God. It's... It's, uh, it's a little rocky, but these are high school students, so I give them a <laughs> benefit of the doubt. Uh, anyways, later on, they did a graphical adventure known as Dream Zone on the PC. However, Jam hit it big when they signed on with Electronic Arts around 1989, 1990, and started to work on a title called Keef the Thief for the Apple IIGS, 
which was, I believe, later ported to the Amiga, Atari ST, and PC. And uh, Keith the Thief, that uh, is the first time that I ever saw the Naughty the Naughty Dog logo. It's like this. Oh, cool. This, uh, it almost looks like Poochie from The Simpsons. You remember? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like no, I remember like that, that old logo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, which is uh, an interesting game in itself. That was composed by Russ Turner. Anyways, this was when they changed the name over to Naughty Dog, but I was looking at some different interviews with um, Andy Gavin and Jason Rubin. They're like, they didn't really remember why the name change actually happened. It just kind of came to be. Uh, but anyways, in 1992, they did another title for EA called Rings of Power. But then Gavin and Rubin kind of split off on their own, you know, went their own directions. Gavin went to MIT and Rubin went to California to learn how to surf. And then also do 3D graphics, but mostly nice. surf, I think. <laughs> um, however, and that's the place to do it. Um, however, they got back together in Boston and started working on Way of the Warrior for the 3DO in 1993. And I guess they were searching around for a publisher since the game was originally self-financed and ended up meeting Universal Interactive Studios, who then published the game in 1994. After signing a three-project contract with Universal, Naughty Dog moved to L.A., hired some new employees, and spent two years working on Crash Bandicoot, which was first shown at E3 in 1996. So jumping five years ahead in 2001, Sony acquired Naughty Dog, which led to Jack and Daxter, the Uncharted series, and The Last of Us. And the rest is history. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, How did Naughty Dog approach you to work on this game, or how did you get the job? Let's see. um, I can't remember if it was Universal Interactive or Naughty Dog that contacted Mutato first. Mutato is the name of the studio where right. I worked. Mut- Mutato Musica, just f- for oh, okay. yeah. anyone who doesn't know. That's Mark Mothersbaugh's studio. Um, I do want to ask you what it was like working there. but uh, Okay, yeah, but, that's but, a whole other... But, but how, did yeah. you, how, did you get this, how did you get this job? We'll, I guess we'll start with there. How did I get the crash job or how did I get the Mutato job? Uh, well, I mean, whatever makes sense, both. Let's just say the Mutato job happened with some persistence and some luck. And I could go into details later if that's something that's interesting to talk about. It's um, very interesting. Just enlighten <laughs> yeah. us. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, basically before I graduated from college, I, I, I visited L.A., and rented a car and I set up a bunch of meetings with different people in the industry to, you know, bug, not bug people for work, but just kind of like ask for advice. And of course I made like, you know, an armful of demo cassettes, you know, with press on letters and you know, a bunch <laughs> of like, you know, kind of horrible music that I had written in the studio, um, at, in my college. And I met with Mark Snow, the guy who did the music for the X-Files. Who oh, was, right super cool the guy was so so nice to me like i I went to his house and like you know i was back in his like you know back studio like kind of where i'm sitting right now in my back you know my basically my backyard and we listened to my demo tape and he was just like wow this is like this is really good you know what i have a good feeling about this and i you know of course i was like thrilled to hear that and then you know years later i was like well maybe he was just being nice but <laughs> that's you know still what? pretty was, impressive i would be just, pretty proud you know what that's I, I was like that guy is cool anyway and i also met with mark mother's boss so um you know i grew up you know I was a pretty big devo geek so it was kind of an imperative that i you know at least go and shake his hand and say thanks for you know you know, Devo. (laughs) Um, So I kept in touch with him over the summer and um, my first summer out here, summer of 92. And I think it was maybe the third time I called him just to like check in, you know, this is before email. So I was actually calling him like at his house, you know, it's ridiculous now. Um, I've answered the phone like five times in like the last year, I'm sure. Yeah. Anyway, so, you know, I, I just happened to call on a good day where he was just like, oh, wow, I was just I was looking for your number just yesterday. I fired my assistant. Do you want to come work for me? And I was like, yeah, I want to come work for you. Um, yeah, nice. awesome. yeah. So there's some good timing there. But I did call him three times. So, you know, that third time. There you go. Third time is charm. Yeah. Hear that there kid's go. persistence. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hear that kid's persistence. <laughs> just bug them enough and it'll happen. Your yeah. dreams can come Stalking. true. Yep. Stalk, <laughs> your, stalk your way to the top. Only the squeaky <laughs> wheels get the oil. <laughs> right, 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 right. All Good right. So what, what, was it, what was the culture like at uh, M- Mutado Musica? Um, when I first started working there, it was literally Mark, Bob, Casali, uh, myself, and a secretary. It was four of us working out of Mark's old house 
And he had a couple of other composers working out of their houses, just like maybe two or three satellite composers that were helping him with some TV music. And that was it. So when I first started working there, um, I, I was given a lot of opportunities pretty much right off the bat. You know, I did a lot of sound design for commercials and I got to help out on some TV shows, you know, like they'd give me like half an episode of Beekman's World or Adventures in Wonderland or, you know, some of these early 90s shows that Mark was working on. Mm -hmm. All the and stuff I grew up on. So many <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Beekman's World was my first real gig, if you want to call it that. Oh, um, wow. And I only scored like, you know, six half episodes. So not a lot, but it was definitely, that was a, that was a really rigorous job though it was like pretty much wall-to-wall -wall music wow so never i proved would, never myself would have thought. <laughs> and then i did a uh, my my first game job was um johnny mnemonic right which was a, a tie-in to the uh, the movie that came out um keanu reeves which is pretty awful i guess um but the, the movie game or the was game? <laughs> uh, well the game was like really interesting i mean it was um it was, I think, over two hours of filmed footage. I, what are those ga kind of games called? There's a uh, name the for them. Cinematic, like, adventure FMV games? games? Yeah, FMV. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was just using a lot of footage of, uh, you know, actors and people as the yes. gameplay. Right. So I guess that was a thing in the mid-90s. And it was, you know, pretty pretty well done. And, and the job was huge. It was not just music, but it was, you know, designing room tones and sound effects and awesome. Foley and... Um, I, I, I shared that job with another guy and, uh, we really, it was a lot of work. And so, um, when I completed that, uh, I was sort of, I've said this in many interviews, I'll say it again. I was sort of unofficially labeled the game guy at Mutato. <laughs> nice. Um, what a great experience though. It was, it was. And, um, the music sounds not, not too bad either. It had Isaac Hayes in it we as, a, as one of the actors. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Why don't we um, talk about some of the, the things that you've done, the, some of the things that you've worked on at Mutato. So you've done um, some TV shows, games. Can you give us some details on some of that stuff? Well, the Naughty Dog relationship was probably the most substantial thing because I did seven games with them. Um, I also did music for a few other games. I did music for um, an Activision game called Interstate 82, mm -hmm. which was a, a sequel to Interstate 80, uh, 76. And that was a fun job just because it was all doing knockoffs of 80s bands that I grew up on. So <laughs> nice. I sat down with the director and basically we just mapped out 15 or 16 bands to sort of pay tribute to. Um, so I wasn't actually knocking off specific songs, but I was knocking off, you know, what would, you know, a Duran Duran outtake sound like or, you know. Yeah. So like a style. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Nice. Um, and then I did work. I, I worked on some animation. I worked on um, I did all the music for Clifford the Big Red Dog. That was a big. That actually happened in between the Crash games and the Jack and Daxter games. Is that um, so is that and that's the show they still like syndicate, right? Or syndicate for yeah. kids and stuff like that. Yes. Wow. Yes. So so I did sixty five episodes of that. Um, My and kid then would I did love a, you. <laughs> <laughs> I did a um, another animated show called Gary the Rat, which is sort of like the polar opposite of Clifford the Big Red Dog. It's a, a, a uh, animation for adults. No, I Kelsey, did. I did see sorry. that with Kelsey Grammer. Right, right, yeah. right. What's that all about? I never saw an episode. <laughs> it's good. It didn't last that long. Um, <laughs> it was one of the first shows they did on Spike TV. So, so it was okay. um, basically the story of a, a New York lawyer who's so sleazy that one day he wakes up as a rat because, you know, he's a rat bastard. <laughs> so he has to live out his life as a rat who's still a lawyer. You know, he can still talk. He still wears the suits. And it's, you know, Kelsey Grammer just being, you know, typical Kelsey Grammer. And um, it's really, I, th I thought it was really funny. I mean, it was just like really sadistic and horrible. Mm -hmm. um, probably wouldn't go over too well in 2018. Um, <laughs> but at the time it was, it was pretty funny and the voice actors were all great. I mean, it was just like, I don't know. It's just an odd show. And the music was really fun to write because it was all this kind of like sleazy, somewhere between sleazy and cheesy jazz or mm -hmm. fake jazz, I guess. Oh, that's the best. Um, and I hired like a, a stand up bass player to, to come in and, and replace all the, the MIDI bass. So it actually had some life to it, you know, just one instrument, one live instrument over the top of all my other stuff. And it really came to life. <laughs> um, awesome. And I did a lot of commercials. I did a ton of commercials. What, what was your favorite commercial that you worked on? Oh God. The one, one we might know. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't know them. I mean, maybe your subconscious would know them. 
All right. So. Um, I mean, I worked. I did, I did a Target commercial. I did a McDonald's commercial. I did a bunch of commercials for Sears, J.C. Penney, Kraft American Cheese. You know, top flight golf balls. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome! Uh, anyway, so and then I did uh, some film work too. I did um, a couple indie films. Uh, one called Bong Water. Yeah, which I was heard of that one. Yeah, <laughs> twenty years ago, it had Luke Wilson and yeah. Jack Black and. Um, I've actually seen and, that movie. It's I liked it. Oh, really? It's, I was in it. I thought it was great. I mean, it's like it's not really a goofy stoner movie. It's more of like a like a slacker romantic comedy, right? Huh? Or something like that. Well, now I have to watch it. Yeah, it's pretty good. The music. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, why don't we actually jump into some music? Uh, we've, All right. we've been talking for a while. The first track that we're going to play from Crash One is called Hog Wild. So we're we'll take a listen to that, and we'll be right back. All right, that was Hog Wild from Crash Bandicoot 1, composed by Josh Mansell for the Sony PlayStation. Excellent track. This yeah. is a very classic. <laughs> well, and, uh, and it's funny for me uh, as a kid, my grandfather, he watched a lot of like Benny Hill and stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, so it kind of, yes. the, the beginning of that has like a Benny Hill it, feel, it except does. for like, totally. like if Benny was in oh like Kentucky God. or something. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it's not, and, a, and even as a kid, it, Oh, what? <laughs> I was gonna say like that is the sensibility. It's like that stupid hillbilly. Mo- I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, well, and I thought I mean, it was I, funny as a kid. Even I was like, oh, it's like, it's like jungly. Uh, so I didn't expect that. But then like yeah. the hillbillies no and pigs, did. like I was like, oh, like as a kid, I, I I thought it was sounded different for the environment. But then yeah. the pig kind of brought it all together. So uh, I thought that was really a really neat track. Like I said, it, it really kind of stands out. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, riding on a pig. Of course, you got to have something that's like kind of hillbillyish a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Good track. Well, that though. was that was definitely the inspiration. You know, for each one of these levels, you know, I had to like tune into what was going on. You know, whether it was a mm-hmm. visual or like just something. And for that particular level, it was definitely like, okay, you're on a hog and you're riding, and it's you know. What else can you do, really? <laughs> Even like Crash and, gives you like this funny look. Like he's like, "I'm gonna do it." Yeah. Like you think I'm gonna yeah. do it? I'm gonna do it. <laughs> yeah, the music he's just very, totally fits. Yeah. So it was kind of unexpected, and it definitely generated a lot of uh, real direct response. Not just from Naughty Dog, but also from Mark Mothersbaugh. He, you know, he called it hillbilly mambo, hill, hillbilly mambo music. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, because of the horns, obviously. Anyway, so yeah, it was that was definitely sort of a turning point as far as um, the crash style kind of going from one place to another. Um, where and, where in development, like, or how how many tracks had you written at this point to get to Hog Wild, or was this pretty early on? I don't really remember. Um, I def I, de- I think I addressed almost all of the jungly stuff first because that's kind of where. I mean, if you were to listen to everything chronologically, you could definitely hear how things went from being just drums and ambience to like, you know, lightening up on the percussion, adding a little like little melodic interjections, like the upstream one where you're floating on the leaf. Mm-hmm. Um, that one's actually pretty musical in the grand scheme of Crash One. You know, it has like kind of a, you know, little tune that comes in every now and again. I want to say Hog Wild happens somewhere in the middle. That it's actually somewhere in the middle in the game too, right? Isn't it one of like the first? 
10 it, levels or something? It's yeah, I, I think it's like, on. yeah, I think it's relatively early on because uh, Brian and I were playing it one night, just kind of goofing around, having some drinks, and we definitely got to that level and we're having some fun. Oh, God. What a what a riot. <laughs> so now you had mentioned that, like, um, like you had an understanding that Crash was going to be riding, like, or interacting with a, a, a hog in this level. So were you getting a lot of visual stuff or? Yes. Like, okay. Absolutely. Yeah, I would go to Naughty Dog. Um, pretty regularly and i also had um my 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 naughty dog music producer dave baggett who would come to visit me every friday and listen to what i had done during the week and you know we'd tweak things and he'd make comments and um and then he'd walk away with like you know the three or four things that i had written that week and then the following week he'd come back with notes on what he had you know delivered to naughty dog and what they had to say over the week so we kind of worked out a system uh, but to get to get back to your point, yeah, I, I was able to a go to Naughty Dog and actually play, you know, works in progress, which really was the best, you know, influence of all. Was just to, like Uh-oh. sit down and say, okay, this is what it's like, and then just sort of like mentally take a, a snapshot right. of what what it, what it felt like. Right, I'm sure that was a huge yeah. uh, help to yeah. uh, your I'm, composing. I know in game development you don't always get that luxury, and I know I've heard a lot of stories where people come in right at the end, or even just sort of basically. The game's done the here. Game's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, give us the soundtrack. Yeah, or they have no idea what the game even is. Uh, we've talked to uh, you know, Barry Leach before, and he's like, oh, yeah, I had like a day to do all the music. I don't know what the game is. I never played it, and yeah. there's really no notes. So it's just like make cool music. But uh, I would assume for something like this on like the PlayStation, like th- that era, like it kind of was becoming much more um, of a a deal like putting things together build, like game teams were much larger so like development like like was an actual like thing yeah where it wasn't just like a few guys just throwing something together it was they actually had you know a process and they probably had some planning going on i'm maybe maybe i'm wrong maybe maybe it was all well, just I'm sure some games were still like that but uh something like this i could see so i wasn't too surprised but you know we always have to ask because you know games were still kind of the wild west back then a little bit so yeah the other thing that I was going to say, the other thing that I that I was able to do was they would send me um, videotapes of people, you know, like their game testers playing the levels, and I would transfer it onto three quarter inch videotape, and then I could actually lock it to my system and almost treat it like uh, I was scoring a TV show, and so oh. I could, you know, synchronize the music to you know someone playing. And that actually worked quite well in, in the late in Crash Two and, and Crash Warped, um, where I could really you know, kind of dial in the right tempo. And even though I wasn't playing the game, so I didn't really have a, uh, a vibe on, on the um, intensity from a player POV, mm-hmm. I could definitely, like, see, like, okay, you're, you know, the polar bear is going this fast, so it's got to be, like, you know... Bum, 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 you know I can't right. overshoot the speed and well, stuff. Yeah. for those type of levels yeah. that were locked in, like you said, those that could I could see that being, like, hugely uh, useful with kind of making it exciting because they're kind of moving at a, a set speed. But then also I could see getting to see how just normal people are casually playing the game on average would give you a rough idea of how someone might progress through and have like trouble or like uh, go slower and and speed up throughout the level so that's a pretty neat idea kind of gauging the pace based on the music i'm actually curious because i took a film scoring class and i did that exact sort of thing and i'm wondering did you use like cue sheets were you triggering sort of things or was it more of a general feel well none you know video games are not really it's not like a linear thing that you're working with, you know, because there is starting and stopping and people, you know, you can't really, I mean, you can now because I mean, you can, it's, uh, how do I address this? (laughs) Let's just say there are a lot of happy accidents that happen when you're, when you're scoring something like (laughs) this, like, you know, especially like the, um, the polar bear, the polar bear one, uh, you know, I, I added in all kinds of like zips and, and boinks, you know, because, you know, invariably you're gonna like. You know, some of it's gonna lock in. You know, just right, by right. chance. Um, but oh, you that's can't clever! Really... I didn't, I didn't think about the randomness of some of those. That yeah. how they actually kind of line up with stuff. Yeah, that's wow. I just, so... My mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as like synchronizing specific things, it's you know maybe a little bit. It, 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 especially for PS One, you know, we're definitely working with just one loop. It's not like we had stems, uh, mm-hmm. like you know in later games. So you know, if I was able to find like just the the right you know, general tempo for any given level. It was, you know, pretty easy just to kind of paint in broad strokes as far as that goes. Right. Nice. Makes sense, yeah. So, yeah. anyway. One thing I wanted to, to bring up is uh, about today's episode, this is a little bit different than our typical episodes, is that the music we're listening to is all 
pre-console mixed music, which is very different because our show, we usually try to go straight to the source and, and get the audio. But Josh was very... Um, outright by saying no you got to play the the, the pre-console mix stuff and <laughs> wh- why, why is this could you explain the the pre-console stuff uh these are basically reference mixes that i made so any anytime um uh the music producer dave baggett came to you know pick up music to to deliver to naughty dog you know i would have to give him like a a, a dat tape or a burn cd and um you know that's what they would listen to so i had to create these reference mixes and they all had to be sort of you know in the ballpark of what they might sound like after they've been squashed into the console. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think I definitely got better and better at, at knowing what was going to sound good in the con- uh, in the console. Mm-hmm. So where was I going with this? Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, yeah, there was a lot of, you know, the, to get the music into the game, it, it took a lot. We, we, there was no streaming audio just because uh, the visuals ate up a lot of the memory. Right. Um, you yeah. know, things like polygon count, you know, things that I don't really know what that means, but, you know. It's okay. Um, the, the, <laughs> the engineers know. That's, it's good enough. <laughs> well, it's funny because when I first started working on Crash 1, uh, one of their guys came over um, with this, like, horrible-looking unit that they wanted to like you know shove into my quadra 800 and it was like a you know a sony sound tool thing and i was like what is this for and they're like oh it's for doing the programming and i was just like i'm not gonna be (laughs) (laughs) you guys can do that so anyway you know to get the music into the game it did take a fair amount of um you know i had to like you know each instrument just got one sample and it was, you know, pretty much in the middle of the range that whatever that instrument played, because it had to be stretched across a, you know, a keyboard like a, you know, like a single sample. Uh-huh. So, anyway, the pre-console mixes were my my best shot at like, okay, this is what it's supposed to sound like. Right. And I would take these with me when we did the final mixes, and we would, you know, play the console mixes up against the pre-console mixes and see how close we we could get it. So the pre-console um, stuff is kind of like the golden master, and then everything after that is just like, well, this is our approximation of what what the intended sound was supposed to be. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Well, and that works out really good, too, for this episode, because normally on the show, we try to cover really more obscure games. We occasionally touch on some of the popular ones. So this is a, probably in the upper range of more popular uh, games. It's probably so one of the most popular titles we've, we've say, talked about. I'd say so. Yeah. yeah. It's so it, millions and millions of copies. So it yeah. gives you like the, uh, the hear the music slightly different than maybe what you would remember or right, what you right. actually heard. So that's, I think it's kind of a nice treat. And I, and I did a little side by side and it does definitely sounds much better in the pre-console mix. <laughs> um, anyways, let's, let's uh, kind of shift our focus back over to Crash 1. Um, so Crash Bandicoot was released on September 9th of 1996 Developed by Naughty Dog and published by Sony Computer Entertainment, um, it was directed by Jason Rubin, one of the uh, the founders of Naughty Dog, and then programmed in part by Andy Gavin, who was the other co creator of right. Naughty Dog. So these, this two man team really did a lot of the work. The story is it's it's kind of a basic, kind of simple story. So there's Doctor Neo Cortex and his assistant uh, Doctor Nitrous Brio. They use this device called the Evolver Ray to mutate different living animals on the island, and they turn them into these beasts with superpowers and super strength. And uh, they experiment on Crash, who at the time is like this peaceful little bandicoot that Doctor Cortex plans to use as like the leader of his animal army soldier thing. <laughs> right. And um, he uh, uses this untested cortex vortex to control him and kind of like make him his like minion but the vortex rejects crash i'm saying a lot of words that like don't even make sense to me so uh (laughs) yeah so i hope you guys can follow along but uh anyways crash escapes and leaps out of a window and falls into an ocean but while crash was in captivity he made friends with this other uh female bandicoot named tana and um since Crash, you know, disappears and, and gets out of there, Dr. Neocortex decides to start experimenting with Tana instead. So uh, that's kind of the uh, the long and the short of the story there. Um, now, I don't remember th- the game really going through much of this story. Was this... Neither do I. Was this in, like, basically the manual? Because when we this, were playing it, I, I just jumped right in. This, and this is like, based is on this, the manual. Yeah. This is I was based like, on I don't remember any of these, like, cutscenes or any I, of this action going on. I don't, I don't remember the story of Crash at all. So, like, from, like, my childhood. Yeah. Nope. I just remember 
the game and then like riding pigs and stuff. Um, but no, it's a, it's a really great game. So the gameplay, it's a, it's a platform game where the player controls the protagonist through several levels in both perspective in both a perspective from behind the character kind of moving forward and also the more traditional side scrolling design. So scattered through the levels are various types of crates, uh, most of which contain these mango like fruits called Wumpa fruits. Cause I guess that's the Island that this mm-hmm. takes place yeah. on somewhere in Australia or South of Australia. While smashing crates appears to be kind of like this minor detail in the game. It's actually kind of a, an important role. It's, it's kind of the, the main thing you do in crash is right. smash these crates. And so uh, it's very satisfying too. Yeah. It's very satisfying and you can collect uh, the, the fruit out of it. And at the end you can like, you know, if you get all of them, all the crates, if you smash them all, you get like a free life or a gem or something like that. It's not overly complex. And I think that's what makes it so fun and easily picked up by anybody is because, you know, you jump right in, uh, you can start smashing stuff, get to the end of the level and then do it all over again. Yeah. Well, this game definitely right off the bat when you first play it, it has that uh, they they nailed that like Sonic mascot lovability feel with some attitude. So uh, anyone that grew up in like the 16 bit era, this was like your your low poly, your your 32 like, bit equivalent, yeah. right? I do. That kind of brings me to a good point. I, I want to talk about the development just a little bit, and this kind of carries on to the other games as well. So Andy Gavin had some really great stories about how Crash Bandicoot came um, came to be back in 2011 on his personal website. Uh, earlier, I mentioned how the team signed this contract with Universal, but at that time, they hadn't really started making a game yet and were just kind of kicking around ideas back and forth for months. When the company relocated, the three-day drive from Boston to LA gave them a lot of time to think and uh, key in kind of on the idea of Crash. So they had studied a lot of arcade games. And remember, this is 1994. So just like Josh was saying, you know, this was like, you know, uh, arcade games were still relevant at the time. And that was kind of like the thing that people did. You know, you went to arcades and that was was the thing. A better Um, day than now. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you know, consoles were still, you know, extremely prevalent at this time but like uh, arcades were were still a thing and people were still going there anyways so they were studying a lot of arcade games and they noticed that a lot of the leading genres were making the transition to full 3d rendering so they figured you know this is going to be a great opportunity to turn uh their favorite genre which is like the character action platformer citing mario sonic and donkey kong country into a full 3d kind of game mm-hmm. so on the second day of their their three-day drive they were brainstorming and put Basically, those two concepts together, a character action platformer done in 3D. And that's not really something that was done in 1994, because the closest we got to like this kind of 3D feel was Donkey Kong Country on the Super Nintendo. Right. The idea, it's it's pretty funny. So the idea they came up with, they called it the Sonic's Ass Game. And it was born from the question, what would a 3D character action game or character platformer game look like? And he said, well, you know, you'd spend a lot of time looking at Sonic's ass. Right. And, uh, you know, aside from the difficulties, uh, you know, with, you know, different camera angles and stuff like that, you'd be looking at the back of the character. If it's a fixed camera angle, you got to see where the character's going. Right, right. So that, that was the, uh, the idea of the game was the Sonic's ass game. And that's, (laughs) and they, and they stuck with that for a very, very long time. Uh, so a little, uh, a few notes on the crash design. So. For example, like what did Nintendo and Sega have that Sony didn't? They had an existing mascot, right? right? So the guys thought, you know, hey, if we can get this out during the launch window, maybe, maybe, just maybe we can fill that kind of that slot. Now, Sony was never, they never officially said, oh, you know, this is our mascot or anything. They, They weren't even, you know, it wasn't made by Sony. So they weren't, you know, on board with that. But. I think it kind of turned out that way, right? They, everybody kind of just took it as the well, mascot. Well, I just remember the the marketing, the commercials for Crash Bandicoot were so ridiculously fun. Oh yeah, they were great. And he was in a mascot costume and a lot of them. So it just it made sense. It made sense. So um, the pursuit for the best creature to use for the game was also kind of half by luck. They wanted something kind of like Sonic, but what Warner Brothers was doing with the Tasmanian Devil. So they got this copy of the Tasmanian Mammals Field Guide. I guess it's like a like a documentary. Yeah, because the Tasmanian Devil was so accurate. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, and they decided on uh, three different things. There was a wombat, a potaroo, and a bandicoot. And funny enough, uh, they chose the they chose the wombat actually first, and they gave it the the tentative title of Willy the Wombat, which uh, they didn't know at the time, but it, it turned into a, a Saturn game that came out in Japan only. Oh, Willy nice. the Wombat, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, but they weren't fan, uh, fully planning on using that in the game because uh, it ended up being an existing IP in the U.S. as well. 
However, uh, Jason ended up saying that for Crash, you know, as we know now, he said, uh, we decided there was there should be no connection between a real animal and the final design. And the final design was mostly like for technical reasons. So Crash's color wasn't blending in with the atmosphere. You know, his head's really large. So, um, yeah, he doesn't really have like a neck. His like head is like attached to directly to his torso. Right. And they made his head large so that uh, you could see his facial expressions, which, you know, you, you had to have something kind of big because the resolution was so bad at the time. And uh, then they said, you know, he doesn't look anything like a wombat. So they just were like, oh, okay, well, I guess it's a bandicoot. And so that's kind of how it came yeah. to be. But same thing you look at it. Sonic doesn't really look like a hedgehog. And Knuckles doesn't look like an echidna. Mario doesn't really like... look like a plumber. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it's all relevant. Anyways, let's get into some music. Sorry for the delay, Josh. Uh, the first track that we picked is um, from Crash Bandicoot 1. And it's called Heavy Machinery. So we're going to take a listen to that. And we'll be right back. You just heard Heavy Machinery, composed by Josh Mansell for Crash Bandicoot 1 on the Sony PlayStation. Yeah, it's another really cool track. It's very different than the last track that we heard. It's very much more like electronic and kind of like clubby Kind of like and robotic. Neon. Yeah. 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 A heavy Machinery, maybe that's... It makes sense. That's the yeah. key word right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely hearing a lot of interesting sound design choices on that one. I'm, I'm wondering if you kind of came together with the sounds or if you had the idea for the track in mind sort of off from the get-go. Well, um, like w- with all these tracks, you know, I, I kind of had to go with what I was looking at as far as, you know, visual cues and, um, you know, sometimes that maybe resulted in stuff that was a little bit on the nose. But for this one, you know, uh, Dave Baggett and I, I got to keep, keep on talking about Dave Baggett because he was really <laughs> like my co-pilot on all these. Um, we had a great love for or we have a great love for, you know, craft work and a lot of um, techno stuff. So. I definitely remember on this one in particular, we it was almost like we were doing a little bit of a wink as to like, oh, this is what video game music used to sound like. Does that make any sense? Mm, you like, have to clarify a, that. It was just like a little bit dinky and, you know, chintzy sounding. I, I don't know what the right words are, but, you know, <laughs> we just... We just tried to make it maybe a little bit more like a chip tune. Oh, okay. Um, I see. I see what you're saying. You know a what little, I mean? So, a little bit more like um, harsh, but like like um, minimalistic in a sense. Yeah, just sort of like. Yeah, I, I don't. I can't really just. I mean, it wasn't really like a deliberate like. Oh, we're gonna do something retro or something like that. But um, we were definitely like grooving on a lot of craft work, and Juan Atkins, Stereo Lab, and Aphex Twin, and. Richard Kirk. I mean, we had all, I mean, that's definitely where, where I was at in a lot of ways mm-hmm. was just lis- listening to a lot of kind of left field t- techno stuff in the nineties. Um, so I tried to, to bring some of that into this one in particular with that, that square wave and some of the other stuff. Yes. Yeah. You could totally hear that. As soon as you mentioned craft work, I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I should have realized, I mean, it definitely has their sort of, their early albums have kind of a, a shonkiness to it, but it's really cool. Yeah. It's very, kind of just a weird mixture of sounds but it works well together and i think that track is channeling that sort of stuff mm-hmm. cool. yeah and when you said that you can kind of i mean we've only listened to a couple tracks so far but uh i mean this one you can really feel like the um like the robotic uh like machine made sounds versus like the more organic kind of sounds yeah, yeah. Big time. well there was definitely like a, a deliberate attempt to sort of you know like i said address the visuals 
And even with the, the jungle stuff, I always wanted to like, maybe like reference stuff that you weren't seeing, you know, sort of like to create the illusion that you were like in a more immersive environment. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. Just like, okay, well, this machine is going off, you know, off to the side or this, you know, jungle drum is happening. It's, you know, being played by an actual person in the jungle. You know what I mean? Right, right, like right. Definitely like trying to like make it sound like, you know, just more, give it more dimension. Mm. Well, and that kind um, of adds to that, that ambient feel that you were kind of talking right. about before. It's like, exactly. not just like we're hearing a tune out of nowhere in a jungle or like in a warehouse or a factory or something like that. It's, it's also part of the, the yeah, environment. It's, uh, it's very, very uh, deliberate. Uh, 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 of the factory of the jungle, right? right however you want to put it. Nice. Um, and definitely that that first um, that first demo that I turned in. There's one called Ambient Power Plant, and um, is that the Ambient Pow Pow? Is that the one you sent me over? Oh no, 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 that's Papu Papu. Oh, Papu Papu. Okay, that's what I thought. But it says it says Ambient Papu, and I thought, oh, maybe you meant Power Plant there. <laughs> like no, a no, no, no. <laughs> So this Ambient Power Plant. What, what's this all about? Oh, I mean, just like when they when they. You guys were talking about um, Willie the Wombat, right? Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the first things they handed us was like sort of a, a Xerox, you know, copy of like, okay, these are the characters in the game, and this is Willie the Wombat, and this is, you know, um, and it sort of loosely told the story that you recounted. Um, but I definitely knew that there was going to be a little bit of an industrial part of the game. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. So I thought, like, well, maybe I'll do something that's kind of cartoony. Um, something that happens in the jungle and maybe something that's a little bit more kind of machine like, <laughs> and, um, it doesn't sound like heavy machinery, but there was definitely like an intention of like, okay, this is like what an, the ambience of a power plant level might sound like in a game like this. I see. So. I see. Oh, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, ambience and, uh, Papu Papu, why don't we, why don't we get into our next track, which is ambient Papu Papu. And this is a demo track. Um, yeah. can you, can you explain the, the, the reason by <laughs> the demo before we get into the Yeah, the music? Cause this is a, a Josh pick. He, he sent, he specifically <laughs> picked some tracks for this episode for you guys. Right, so. right. You want me to talk about it before or after? Uh, well, okay. I guess why don't we just listen to it? This is. <laughs> I'll just say this is my this is my first attempt at doing music for Papu Papu. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Now let's take a listen and, and find out how the first attempt went. All right, that was Ambient Papu Papu Demo, composed by Josh Mansell for Crash Bandicoot 1. Yeah, this is this is a cool track. I, it's a lot, uh, it's very soothing feeling, and uh, it's a little less erratic. Maybe erratic's not the best word, but you know how like in some of the other tracks, it's like uh, <laughs> you kind of have like sections that are popping up, you don't know where it's going, and you kind of have like this this feeling of you don't know what's going to come up next in the song, which a lot of times, you know, echoes what's going on in the game. But this one was very like soothing and the the drums and everything was so like rumbly and it made you feel like you were kind of there like you could like you were there with the dr the big old drums and stuff like that it was really neat yeah you know this one reminded me of is um pokemon snap <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know why you just being in, being in this uh in this cave uh you can kind, you can kind of hear these like a uh, little water like droplets kind of like falling off to the side mm -hmm. and it kind of has this uh I don't know, this almost... Um, a lot of ambience. Yeah, ambience. Uh, it has this, uh, I wouldn't say claustrophobic, but I feel like I'm in a cave. You know what I mean? It makes me feel like I'm in some kind of um, some kind of, kind of of dark and murky cave, but it's also kind of beautiful at the same time. Yeah. I kind of like felt like track. surrounded by the sound is kind of the, the feeling that I got. Right, right, Maybe right, not right. in a cave, but like yeah. they, the, you were in the middle of the music instead of like in front of it or like, you know, watching it. You were like there. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, with all the heavy reverb and and just it, actually to your point, you mentioned that earlier. This track definitely has the most melodic parts. Really, aren't that melodic. It's much more textural and ambient. And I think it's a really cool contrast. All right. So tell us about this uh, this demo. Well, it was a big fat fail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> For all the reasons you said, it was definitely not. I mean, it was my first attempt at writing any boss music for any game ever. So oh, this I didn't is even a, really. This is boss music. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. Sorry, yeah. Josh. I, I, I would never agree with that. Would have worked great as level music. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, but there was a lot of things that was wrong with it. It was definitely like I had no idea. You know that. Well, first of all, I mean. When I saw the video of Papu Papu, I was like, this is not that dangerous. I don't know what they're talking about. It's like, he's almost like this like animatronic guy who's like just sort of rotating on right, you know, right, on, a, right. on, a, on a stick or whatever, you know? Yeah. So I, almost I, for, not, I, did, I almost didn't know he was a boss either when yeah. I first saw him. I was like, this is, is he going to like give me some like Because he doesn't chase you around. Food it's or just something? like, a, it's like a whack-a-mole level. <laughs> right. you know? it's yeah. like, so anyway, I don't know what I was thinking. I probably tossed that thing off like in a couple hours. To your point, um, there's way too much reverb on it, you know that that would have never translated into anything <laughs> meaningful yeah. on a PlayStation One. <laughs> so it just, you know, it just didn't work. And uh, what ended up being the Papa Papa music, I thought was pretty good. Um, that's actually one of the few times I use a drum loop uh, rather than programming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it was just kind of a cool groove. And actually, I had someone send me another song like a pop song to use the same the same loop that i used i was just like oh my god that's why i don't use loops <laughs> um anyway so yeah it was just a, a failed attempt and i don't think it was really until the second crash game that i actually sort of got a handle on maybe what what a uh, a, a good boss, boss fight theme sounds like you know because anyway yeah i was gonna say you know i love the track it's 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 a really yeah, it's, great track it is. Mm-hmm. um that's why you know i was thinking oh you know it, i'd be you know kind of in this cave kind of like walking through it very slowly and stuff but when you said oh this is the boss track i was like yeah uh, <laughs> not so much <laughs> yeah not so much there josh <laughs> um <laughs> but still a great track uh thanks uh, for thanks for sending that over i'm really yeah, glad sure. to hear one it. is it's this is uh, one of the special things that we get from an episode like this worth having the composer on is uh, getting stuff that wasn't released and yeah. you know, maybe wasn't the best fit for where it was designed, but it's still, it's still a neat track. It's way awesome, yeah. Uh, let's get into another track. This has kind of got a, a, a story behind it, I'm sure, too. This is the uh, Neo Cortex track, and this is the Japanese version. So let's take a listen ah. to that, and we will be right back. That was the Neo Cortex theme from uh, the Japanese version of Crash Bandicoot, composed by Josh Mansell. Why did you pick this track? Because I thought this was I thought this was pretty uh, uh, kind of uh, flashy. It almost reminded me of the. Uh, and I'm looking at James because I'm thinking he's going to say the Chips Ahoy commercial for a second, but uh, a little <laughs> bit. But I it, so for what I wrote down when I was listening to it is that it's you know it's much more menacing, but uh, it the game. One of the things I love about Crash Bandicoot is that it the game never seemed to really take itself overly serious. Oh yeah, and, it's a big joke. Uh, half the and time. this and this track is it's like a it's like that but for menacing and yeah. But it, so it reminded me of like theatrical like a stage performance of menacing like I'm so bad I can feel it in my bones I got to get up and dance like yeah, right, you know right, like, right. you know like West Side Story or Grease or something right, like that right. which I I loved because it it 
even though when things started getting heavier, you still had a smile on your face when playing, you know, Crash Bandicoot. Exactly, exactly. Well, those stupid piano octaves will get you every time, you know. It's like the, <laughs> the elementary school version of Danger. Um, yeah, so when I was when I thought I was all done doing Crash 1, uh, there was a last-minute freakout in uh, Sony Japan, and um, they, they were not really vibing on, you know, the direction that we had taken with the soundtrack. And I think they had sort of gotten used to a lot of the level stuff, but basically I had to redo all the boss music um, and Tana's theme too. And um, that pesky boss music coming back to get you again. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. You know what? You know, it's funny when I listen to when I listen to the Japanese cortex, I'm just like, oh, OK. So even though this is kind of a dumb piece of music, like there is a little bit of a sensibility that I took from it, you know, maybe not the melody or the beat or whatever, but there's definitely like a little bit of something that I can hear that like would show up later in the later soundtracks. Uh, okay, um, I see that. I don't know if it's like a like a driving beat, you know, a backbeat sort mm-hmm. of thing. Um, you know, there's definitely something there. Anyway, so they didn't give me a lot of reference for what they wanted. They said that they wanted it to sound like the Disney Main Street Electrical Parade. <laughs> um, and, you know, I didn't know what that sounded like. I just was like, okay. And I, I, I think I did about, I think I did five themes maybe in a day and a half and i just sort of knocked them all out right they, they um, wanted five new tracks for the for the um for the first game yeah i'm looking at the cd here they wanted uh, a new tana a new brio a new cortex a new pinstripe a new kong and that's it yeah so oh man five. so yeah. when they when they made that when they made that request to you like <laughs> hey you got to redo these tracks were you like oh my god like seriously like <laughs> i just composed like this whole this whole album well you know what if it if it was such a short amount of time that I had to do it that I, I didn't really have time to like get bummed out or anything like that. I was just sort of like, all right, well, you know, there we go. You know, I yeah, gotta yeah. get it, gotta get it done. You know, if, if they'd say like, oh, you have a month to do it, you know, I'm sure I would have like lost my mind. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it, it's funny, not just the music, but the game too had to undergo some changes because uh, Sony Japan, they, they were looking at it and they're like, you know, this just looks too American made. You know, we, we need something that kind of speaks to, um, Japanese like it ha- needs to have more of a Japanese made look to it to to sell well here and so they they did some design changes they took away all the English stripped it all out and mm-hmm. made it all Japanese text did a little rework on Crash himself uh, and, and the I love title. the covers right the, the right. covers are really cool because uh, when because uh, I mentioned earlier that Brian and I sat down together and played some of the games um, and we played I have the Japanese copies right that's uh, what so we're we playing. played uh, the Crash 1 and 2 so we were listening to this music right and uh, so I, at that point I didn't even know because I grew up playing the you know the American Crash Bandicoot games and I only got the Japanese ones because I have a modded PlayStation that can play <laughs> them and they're far cheaper <laughs> so yeah, right. uh, and you know there's not a lot of English or a lot of text anyway so um it's but probably I, well, I we didn't, didn't even know, know the story yeah but i didn't even know that uh, there was much of a difference until doing this episode so right 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 well they really didn't like the tana theme and i don't think anyone did i don't think anyone liked the the, the other tana either it's like <laughs> it's so weird um anyway it, I, I think it's interesting because you know the japanese actually the sony japan cared about it enough to to try and mold it or reshape it a little bit and the way i understand it is that it was really the first american made game to make any sort of impact in japan right um and maybe it was those tweaks you know maybe just making things a little bit more round and mario like did the trick um and they also wrote their own theme song you know that mm-hmm. that cra- have you heard that crash bandicoot song that japanese one oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what? that was like a whole thing. Like, um, that, that have you seen that video? Oh yeah, big Where, time. That that's yeah, that, that like, commercial. Is that what you're talking yeah. about? That goes yeah. down and that go down. That goes down in history. I mean, it's like it's so. I I I still can't believe it. It's like so <laughs> crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyway. But so. yeah, Crash Bandicoot did great. I mean, I think Bash, Crash Bandicoot One was the highest selling uh, American made game in Japan until Crash Two came out. So, right. I mean. Right. Yep. So that's why that's why I chose that one, just because there is a little bit of something to talk about. It was there. all because you uh, changed those five tracks. Did they more? Or yeah, like, man. <laughs> I'm curious. Did they more or less take them as they were first first go around, or like, yeah, that's good? Or did you have to do a lot of tweaks afterwards? Oh, I. As far as I, I think they just took them as is. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, well good. Like, so I think, you didn't have a lot I of time to work on them. So, I, like, yeah, I mean, it doesn't <laughs> sound like it. Then, if you don't remember a whole lot of it, but um, I'm curious. You mentioned a little bit about how you worked on it, but can you go a little bit more into the process of how you wrote the music for you know, like how you worked with the teams, you know, just over the whole development process. Tempo was definitely a big thing for me. Um, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about like watching, you know, videos of, of the testers playing the games and actually mm-hmm. playing works in progress. Um, so I would, you know, being a, a, a percussionist primarily, um, I was definitely very concerned with like, okay, well, how, how fast is this going to be? So I would sort of lock in like just with a click track, what I thought was appropriate. And then, I would sort of assess what I was looking at and maybe where it fit into the story, even though, you know, that story you told, you know, the storyline of Crash was not super prominent in the game. I knew that there was definitely like things to pay attention to. Right. So, you know, based on sort of the visual and the gameplay intensity, I would pick a, you know, I would choose instruments that I thought would be appropriate. That makes sense. You know, just getting an instrument palette together, keeping in mind that they had to be pretty short sounds, um, you know, instruments that I wouldn't want to play a chord on, you know, just single line type stuff. And then I would just go from there. And I would, you know, uh, with a lot of these, I would start with the, you know, the the percussion programming just to see if I could get a, a groove that felt good. And that's just kind of how I thought about the music at the time. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Over the course of, se- you know, so the seven games with Naughty Dog, I sort of flipped it on its head and, you know, went against my grain and, and you know, started to think about like, a, you know, more melodically, more on the top side of things. Uh, but it took a long time to get there. Oh, wow. And um, I mean, I definitely think the crash music was, you know, the music was appropriate for the game. You know, oh, it definitely totally needed, totally. you know. Anyway, so, yeah, I, would yeah, definitely I mean, we're talking think about, about it because we love it. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. And then I hang up the phone and be like, oh, God. Oh, God. That was um, that demo track, that, <laughs> that pop out music. Oh, my God. What the hell? <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> terrible. Boss music. Um, Come on. <laughs> oh, no. Well, that's really interesting. Like the process, though, like of just um, starting from the, the lower end. And, and I think it. I think that makes sense. It kind of resonates with uh, the rest of the soundtracks because like we were saying earlier, the, the percussion and the, um, you know, different timpanies or whatever, they, they take a very kind of front and center approach. Mm-hmm. Um, right. A lot more, a lot more emphasis on that. And like the melody is like sometimes there, sometimes it's kind of just a, like a ghost. It's, it's non-existent, but it, it, it'll creep in every now and then it just shows that that's not the main focus. I mean, there was another reason for that too, and and that that is that you know these these tunes are not that long. You know, they loop over at about two minutes, and having wall to wall melody just didn't seem right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you know Naughty Dog was. I mean, the reason why they handed me that Dead Can Dance cassette first thing is that they wanted something that would have some longevity to it, and they knew that you know when people play video games, they play them for hours and days and years, or, you know, however long. And so there was definitely like, okay, we need to have this be somewhat memorable and catchy, but not totally just kill everyone with, you know, wall to wall tune. Right. right. So, um, you know, I'll go back to that upstream track from Crash One. That was definitely kind of like, oh, that was like an aha moment where we we're just like, okay, well, maybe if we just have things sort of like interjecting and like, you know, over the course of time, you'll realize that it is musical, but maybe it's not just like some sweeping melody that, you know, you whistle on your way out to <laughs> school or whatever. Right. Yeah. So what software and hardware are you using and uh, how did that wor- end up working out with, uh, you know, translating to PlayStation sequence data? I was using Studio Vision MIDI sequencing software and my sound sources were um, basically a lot of MIDI sound modules and also I had two Roland samplers that I loaded up with stuff from sample CDs and um, I also did a lot of custom samples too for there's you know sometimes like guitar chords and like the harmonica licks and um, Hogwell those were all kind of pre-recorded little phrases awesome. that I did who 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 did the the actual recording or who who played those was it like people local that you found or did you actually play those instruments it depends on what you're talking about I mean I did a lot I mean there was definitely some percussion stuff that I did did you play that mouth harp. No, that's a sample. Actually. Oh, okay. That's, I was gonna say that's you, a pretty sweet. That's all over Rugrats, by the way. You know, oh. you can you can hear a lot of crash sounds in Rugrats because we were all kind of working with the same you know stuff. Right, right. You know, it depends on what you're talking about. I mean, I did some of the, um, I did a lot of lap steel samples 
through a space echo. You can hear that on one of the Cortex themes. I can't remember which one, if it's the second one or the third one. The harmonica was actually created for a sitcom that was done before I even started working there. So Mark had kind of like a, uh, a library of like harmonica licks. Oh, wow. Um, so that's, and I would take those samples too and like chop them up further and like, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of tweak them out. Um, I think there's actually a Devo sample in one of the tracks, but I can't say which one because <laughs> oh, I'm trouble. Um, just a guitar part, you know, just a little part of a multi-track that I was like, ah, I need that. <laughs> oh, that's so, awesome. Anyway. All right. Uh, do you want to move on to Crash 2, James? Sure. Yeah, so Crash 2, Cortex Strikes Back, came out on the Sony PlayStation October 31st, 1997, once again developed by Naughty Dog and published by Sony Computer Entertainment, composed by Josh Mansell, and once again directed by Jason Rubin and programmed by Andy Gavin. So uh, let's get into the first track of Crash 2, and this is the Crash 2 theme. We'll be right back. You just heard the theme from Crash 2, composed by Josh Mensell on the Sony PlayStation. I think this track has a lot more, um, a lot more meat behind it. Uh, it seems like a, a direct evolution of that first one, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I like this one. I, this is actually my favorite theme out of the whole series. I think. Yeah, I, I think I, it's really good. I felt like uh, when I listened to it that um, every like the whole the team as a whole had a maybe a better understanding of who crash was and what the sound was going to be and i also this track kind of to me feels like a little bit of a cross section of maybe what you might expect to see in the game like it feels like there's a lot of different themes and hints at at uh there's a lot more different fun. textures it, it, and it's a lot more like fun and like peppy and happy feeling as as well i think and i think this directly or more so than the first one takes a um a, a, a closer approach to the uh, the saturday morning cartoon kind of gig right yeah, I mean, you I mean, you obviously work with Mark Mothersbaugh, but I definitely hear a lot of the sort of film and TV influences, especially in this track. It's sort of the I don't know, I I remember listening to a lot of Alan Silvestri scores back in the day and it just it reminds me a lot of what was going on in in film and TV music at the time. I'm wondering if that's what was going on with you guys. I think well, there was definitely a concerted effort to like just sort of bump it up and say like, "Okay, this is a thing. It's a popular game now." And so let's like really like get exciting, get excited about it. I think the, the the hidden influence on that one was probably some sort of Austin Powers thing, <laughs> like some sort of like you know it's got a little bit of like the the punchy horns, and the, you know the the flute fall. You know it's a little bit kind of sixties swinging yeah, right. swinging jazz or whatever. I can see that. My dad was very into Austin Powers, so <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think everybody was in the nineties, man. That was the thing. So. Uh, but once again, you know, it was kind of written not after the fact, but I mean, it, it wasn't really designed to like, you know, you don't hear that music, that that particular, any of those um, themes anywhere in the game, you right. know. So maybe that's why it has sort of a, I don't want to say rarefied, that's a little bit pretentious, but you know, it's like kind of, it's, it's kind of cool because it's, you're not totally beaten over the head with it as a theme, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's my favorite theme from, from all the games, too, if that matters. <laughs> good, good. We're on the right track. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, excellent stuff. So, James, tell us a little bit about the game so we can get in some more music. Sure. So, this game takes place directly after the first one. Uh, there's even a little opening of Crash beating Dr. Cortex, a little cutscene. And you see Cortex fall from space, landing in a dark cave filled with uh, powerful glowing crystals. And then, I guess, a year later, uh, the game picks up where uh, he's worked with a new colleague, uh, Dr. Ingen, and they've made uh, the Cortex Vortex, uh, which is I, I don't know if that was they reused well, that well, name. Well, it was or... it was a it was a beta kind of thing when they when they did it in Crash uh, One. So maybe like they they 
got it out of beta state and make it a one now the rebuilding product it, or, now these or new something. crystals added uh, extra power i guess so but then they realized that they needed 25 more crystals to complete it so in this game they abduct crash and they try to trick him into doing what Dr. Cortex wants, which is uh, collecting all his crystals. And they do this by telling him that, that they can use the crystals to save the world, which has the ability to alter the planetary alignment, keeping the world safe from being destroyed. So, But Crash is warned by his sister Coco and Dr. Cortex's former assistant, Dr. Nitrous Brio. So he makes a return as well. So it's kind of neat. The game takes place directly after the first one. And you even see some returning like side characters and stuff like that. So yeah. um, they tell him to not collect the crystals, but collect the gems instead. So in this game, you get to collect uh, both crystals and gems. So there's a lot going on right off the bat compared to the first so game. So you're basically not listening to anybody. You're just doing your own thing. <laughs> The yeah. whole time. So this game is still a uh, 3D platformer utilizing the different vantage points, uh, which is one of the neat things about the game. When I played it as a kid, it struck me. It wasn't just always side-scrolling. It wasn't always just moving towards and away from the camera. Uh, so it I'm mixes, not going to go in. It mixes it up a lot, yeah. Yeah, so I'm not going to go into too much of the mechanics, the gameplay details, because a lot of them were very similar with uh, the exception of maybe like the slide, uh, which I don't remember being in the first game. But uh, a little hint, if you're playing the game, if you slide and then jump, you can do a little bit higher jump. But Never knew that. So basically, like I said, there's 25 crystals, one for each level, and you're awarded a crystal for every level that you beat. So just beat the level and you get a crystal. So easy peasy, collecting all the crystals. Mm -hmm. Each of the levels are arranged in five warp rooms. So in the beginning of the game, you start in a room and you can pick whichever level you want to go to, kind of a, a la Mega Man-ish, I guess. So right. you can, if you have trouble with one level, you can kind of pick a different one, get a crystal and and uh, get a feel for the game. Uh, and they all have boss fights. So there's five warp rooms with five levels in a boss fight. So now the gems are a little bit harder to collect and there's a lot more of them. There's 42 gems to be exact. So to collect the gem, you need to destroy every box in the level, including the nitro boxes, which are dangerous. Uh, they will deal damage to you. So you have to you have to break open those boxes as well plus the boxes in the alternate paths so yeah so there's alternate paths in this game too Jeez, because uh, I, I think when we played it through together like we were, were like not even halfway on some of the boxes and yeah and so and the collecting crates. the crystals or uh, collecting the gems you know makes a difference in the game so uh you use those to towards the end i guess uh, i don't know if i really want to spoil it no no we'll just so, keep it out just keep it out um but yeah, like I said, you, the, the game handles pretty much the same. I think that's true for all the games. There, there's some right. minor differences, but they all kind of have that same kind of core yeah. crash gameplay to them. Right. So like the a lot of the, the different moves, the boxes, all that stuff, it's, it's very similar. They feel like they go together really well, like almost like they were just one right after the other. Yep. Like Not like they tried... Uh, reinventing it or anything like that. So it, it, that was one thing I loved about it. Um, so like I said, the game looks and feels very similar, which is both a plus and a minus depending on who you're talking to. But there were improvements for the second game uh, and some other proposed improvements that um, they decided not to, like um, adding ground fog. Uh, they wanted to, uh, from what I understand, the ground fog was a thing that was they were thinking about adding to the jungle levels, but uh, they scratched it due to the many, many, many PlayStation games that were adding fog to hide low poly counts and things right, like that. So, which yeah, I think yeah. ended up working out good in their favor. But like I said, it looks very similar, but it is on a new engine. It's on the Ghoul 2 or the Game Oriented Object Lisps 2 engine, which is three times faster, could handle 10 times more animation and twice the poly count. So, the game side by side is noticeably improved, improved right. but it still doesn't feel like um a great departure which i thought was really good uh so if, if you play the games back to back you'll notice it but it's it still feels the same place right. really but if, well. if you waited until the next one was out you'd be oh yeah this looks kind of better but you wouldn't really have that direct comparison unless you just played them back right to back. That makes sense. for me when i love going back and playing games i like it when the games there's they're not like a massive difference yeah, like yeah. i like to see like they feel like the second one, you know, looks and feels kind of similar, even though if technology's progressed really rapidly. But. Which is funny because the music actually seems like a like a major overhaul. Like it seems so much more fledged out. Not that the first soundtrack was lesser in a way, but the the second one just feels more just larger. I guess it just feels like a bigger a bigger score, more grand. Right, yeah. like you were saying, Josh, the first game was a hit, so I'm sure there was a lot yeah. more attention, a lot more. Maybe even like money and time and details were allowed to be to put into it. 
Well, not time. It was definitely the same amount of time for each game, but it was definitely an easy, relatively easy schedule. You know, I had about mm-hmm. six months to do each each soundtrack. So, but you're right about the the, the overall sound quality and a lot of it has to do with a me just sort of getting better at realizing how to work within the limitations the technical limitations Mm -hmm. and also i did not do the final mixes on the first crash game that was all done sort of remotely um they had a dedicated person at naughty dog who did the mixes and he did the best he could but i did not go in with pre-console mixes and you know spend a lot of time on it it was all just sort of here you go. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I spent, you know, the, the rest of that year playing Crash 1 in my house and listening to it and thinking to myself, okay, well, that bass doesn't come, come through very well on the mm-hmm. TV speakers and, like, why did I do that? And that sucks. And, you know, I got really critical about a lot of different things. And I went into Crash 2 with, like, okay, this is going to be really punchy and, you know, I'm going to make it sound better because I want to keep working with these guys, basically. Right, right. So, I mean, even though you said you didn't get more time than the previous game, you still had time to reflect on the, the first oh, yeah, game and a little way, bit more experience, way, too. Way, way, better prepared. Nice. Um, so, and I, you know, and I did sit down and... and I was there for the final mixes, so that mm-hmm. definitely helped. Yeah. Uh, well, but, yeah. After you run the gauntlet the first time, the second time yep. is a little easier. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, let's uh, let's get him some more music, James. What do we have? This is a track that we picked. Yeah. So the first track that we picked is called Komodo Bros, and we'll be right back. You just heard Komodo Bros, composed by Josh Mencel for Crash 2, Cortex Strikes Back. This is one of my favorite tracks, actually. I love Mm -hmm. this. It's got that Japanese flair to it, but at the same time, like, it has this this surf rock, and then out of nowhere comes a didgeridoo. Yeah. I love it. Um, for for me, there was a, this felt a little bit like a uh, like a musical buffet. Um, there was a lot of <laughs> different themes. Like I picked up on like you know the didgeridoo gave it a very kind of like uh, jungly tribal feel, and then there was a little bit of like a spy Bondish James Bond type feel shortly after that and then even like some i thought you were gonna say bondage stuff i was like wait what uh but then there was even some with some of the drum hits later on it kind of gave it even like a mission impossible type feel to it so it felt like a 
like very exciting, lots of action and uh, environment. So they had that ambience, but then also that draw that uh, can take you, you know, make you notice the music. So it's really neat. Yeah, I love that. Uh, what is that like? Uh, I don't even know what you call that. That kind of China splash. That it's almost like a harp kind of sound. Um, I'd have to go back and listen to it again. There's, there's definitely a lot going on in that track. Yeah. Um, hold on, I gotta take off my leather mask, my bondage <laughs> mask. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, the Komodo Bros. I, when I was listening to it, I could definitely hear a little bit of my my techno showing. Just that part in the middle where it kind of gets all like like overly syncopated, and you can hear that kind of f- those fast kind of artificial drum rolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like straight out of like some, you know, UK breakbeat techno <laughs> jungle stuff, you know. So I was definitely listening to a lot of that stuff. So I, I try to sneak in some of that stuff in the drum programming every now and again. Um, yeah, that was definitely me, you know, sort of advancing in, in, in my, my boss theme skills, I guess. You know, just making something that's like really like, you know, frenetic and fast paced. And um, instead of having like, fragments of uh or i should say just in, instead of having like melodic interjections every once in a while it's almost like you're just constantly changing the channel you know like the riffs mm-hmm. change up and uh you know things <laughs> good they, point yeah things do repeat throughout the track and i try to do like a little bit of like theme and variation with just like the little you know riffs and tiny bits of melody that are happening there right um yeah, it, it seemed like a, a blend between something that was somewhat ambient and somewhat melodic. It wasn't either, like, overly of either. Um, it's very yeah, hard to pinpoint this, like, genre, I guess, if you're going to try to, mm-hmm. you know, pinpoint it on one thing. There's, there is a lot there. So, yeah, I can I can see the talking about going all over the place with the track, but I think it works. It just sounds like a quintessential Crash Bandicoot track. Like, a lot of the elements that you had in the first game, like with the sort of surf guitar and some of the the themes that you had with the marimba and that that 16th run that goes down and up. Right. It just feels like I'm not as familiar with the soundtracks, but I've been listening to them over the last couple of weeks, and it really feels like if you play this track like and the themes, yeah, you, you know what you're expecting. There's there's just like a consistency to it that I really like. Yeah, there's an interestingness because a lot of games, you know, you listen to a, a lot of old retro games like NES stuff, and it, the the melodies are what makes it really memorable. And be like, oh yeah, that's this game, that's this game. But you can play if someone's played Crash Bandicoot and you play some of these tracks, I would guess that a good fair amount of them would say, oh, is this like Crash Bandicoot or something like that? Like, it's, oh yeah, yeah. So it didn't need so much the melody to make it memorable, which I thought was a really neat aspect to the game. I, I mean, I, I, can, I can speak to that. I mean, like, this is where I, you know, I, I can definitely hear just my own evolution as a composer in some ways, because, um, you know, when I first started off, I was just all drums, you know, so maybe there's some overcompensation there, you know, if I can't, like, come up with, like, a catchy tune, you know, maybe I'll just make it, you know compelling in another way yeah <laughs> and then over the you know the games i think i got better at locking into like certain you know melodies or whatever but now i was going to ask like with working on these games we've heard a few tunes now throughout this episode and you know, there's a lot of variation a lot of things going on would you feel that like working on these soundtracks really pushed you to try a lot of different things out of your comfort zone or is this something a little bit more of like naturally kind of how you would work no, I mean, I definitely, I mean, like what I'm trying to say is I think I, I, I kind of like learned how to write in a certain way throughout these games. You know, there was a lot of latitude given to me to try out new things. So mm-hmm. there was the comfort zone thing. It's like I kind of felt like it was just like nothing but freedom in some ways. You know, mm-hmm. I, I was, you know, obviously they gave me revision notes and, you know, certain things didn't work. But um, I mean, the thing that was really kind of special about working on this game is that we were all, you know, relatively the same age. You know, we were like all in our 20s. You know, I've said this before, but it's almost like, you know, dad gave us the keys to the car and we were just like, all right, we're out of here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> nice. um, trying different things. And, um, you know, that hog wild was definitely the you know, when I turned that in and people were just like, yes, this is <laughs> awesome. I was like, OK, now we I, I, I just felt like, you know kind of the wind beneath my sails and just like all right well let's let's get crazy you know um that's, so that's awesome i mean I, I definitely feel like the whole crash experience for me anyway was definitely like 
kind of a once in a lifetime thing where it's like all you know the so many stars were in line to mm-hmm. like make something like this. And I'm not just talking about the music, but I mean, just like to have the whole thing sort of like the, the way it took off the, the way, way it did. did. Yeah. You know, it's just like we were given the opportunity to create something special. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that it, we did, you know, I mean, it's, yeah, it's hard for like a, you know, like you said, it was the perfect timing. I mean, the studio was newer and it, it a bunch of young guys. Up. I mean, you can't walk into Naughty Dog now and have like the same experience as you would working on Crash. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's synonymous with the PlayStation One. I mean, when I think of like the top few games, I always think of the, the Crash Bandicoot series. Oh yeah, big time. I think everybody does everywhere. So, oh yeah, and like you said earlier, I think Crash had like a Sony mascot feel to him, even though he wasn't an official mascot. So, I agree. Like, everybody would say Crash was the mascot of Sony. So it, so it, it adds to that that feeling of when you think of playstation you think of crash bandicoot right right right. what were some of the biggest challenges for composing uh this soundtrack well let me think about that for a second i actually have a little cheat sheet here because i knew you were going to ask that question so let me (laughs) remind myself of my my awesome answer to that um hold on a sec well sorry (laughs) this is gonna be this is definitely gonna be an awesome answer i could tell um, it's something I've already said before. It's just kind of like, you know, there were technical restraints, but I tried to turn those restraints into a style, you know what I mean? Like, right. so if things are like overly percussive or like kind of boinky boink, you know, it's like, because I wasn't really able to like use a lot of sustained notes and a lot of, you know, high production value stuff. So I just tried to make the most of it. So in some ways it was a challenge to like, you know, it would be frustrating because like, oh, I can't like, you know, use this sound or that sound. But um, actually, with every successive game, there was a little bit more memory given to Mm -hmm. sound effects and music. So it wasn't like I was working with the same bag of rocks the whole time. I guess that was, you know, the challenge was just to sort of like say, okay, well, this is what I can do. You know, I I can't go out of this thing that I've made, but I'm just going to make the most of it. And and sometimes those bounds are actually... They kind of help structure, I think, right? Oh, yeah. Like sometimes oh, yeah. we have those limitations. Um, we saw it like a lot earlier on, like the NES or or uh, Game Boy. Any chip based, you know, music had these these limitations that composers had to work with and kind of like assimilate that that knowledge to uh, the chip and a- actually, you know, stay in the confines to do something creative. And I think that's what you were able to pull off with the PlayStation, even though you're just using the PlayStation's built in basically sequence data, you know, you're able to, to really work with that and uh, kind of exploit like the, the good things about it. Yeah, exactly. And one of the greatest things, so for me, the, you know, I don't make music or anything like that, but as a professional artist, like having a lot of limitations sometimes can make things interesting and can, you know, create some really dynamic and interesting pieces especially when you're able to hide those limitations and you know like we like you mentioned with earlier stuff brian the you know you don't really feel the limitation sometimes with the the old stuff it's the way that it's designed it works the way that it was right it feels like it fits with what you're seeing and and sometimes you don't notice that and then other games that maybe don't do it as well well i mean keep in mind i was using the same setup for any project that i was doing so you know if i was used to like doing something a lot more elaborate or um, sound designy or you know reverby or whatever on a commercial. I, I I knew that I couldn't you know do that in the the crash game. So there was always like an awareness of um, you know even though I had all kinds of things at my disposal that I could have done had you know it been twenty years later and I was able to stream audio and blah blah blah. Right. Um, it, but you're right though about the um, you know the limitations can be a good thing. You know you just kind of have to like it's you know it's an attitude that you take. Yeah. And everyone else had similar limitations as well. Oh, Maybe I know, not I the same, say, which is neat. Oh, what were, you, what were you saying? I was going to say, I mean, like, w- when I was sort of, like, on the tail end of, you know, doing music for the Jack and Daxter series, you know, things had definitely shifted into, like, you know, the, more of an orchestral type thing, which is definitely kind of standard fare these days, you mm-hmm. know, to do right. a big, you know, big Hollywood epic orchestral thing or whatever. And it was at that time where there were definitely people kind of reaching back into like chip tunes and the whole 8-bit thing and being like, oh, this is like, you know, this is so great. And, you know, some of the um, electronic music I was listening to definitely had a little bit of that flavor. But it wasn't until that time that I really sat down. I and mean, I'm still not like a huge, like I don't 
I'm not like a I'm not that knowledgeable about like 80s video game music, but whenever I hear it, I am really impressed with like just what they were able to pull off just musically with this like really limited palette or whatever. It's just like, mm-hmm. okay, I get why people are into this. And I've I actually started following. Well, you got some people 99, in- you got 99 episodes to catch up on. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, there's people that I've, I've, I've followed on SoundCloud that like they've, they've made it like their point to like really like emulate this whole thing. And it's like, goes so far beyond like the sounds and the instruments. It's like just composing in a certain way where mm-hmm. it's like, you know, this, there's this thing that I, um, this album, uh, by this, I don't know if it's a band or a guy or whatever it's called, uh, City Guys. Not and it's familiar. just like this, like, just look look for it on SoundCloud. Okay. And it's I'm just like, this, is, that the, name of the, is that the name of the artist or the, or the songs? Or? I think it's the name of the, the you know, whatever the, the, the band is called. And mm-hmm. I don't know if City it's guys. one person. Okay. Yeah, City Guys. It's actually, yeah. And it has some sort of like goofball, you know, NES looking cover art. But I love it. It's It's so weird and i don't know it's cool yeah <laughs> i don't know why i don't know why i'm plugging city guys but i just like, <laughs> really I, I really like it so. nice right, now, anyway. we'll have to put a link on the on the in the show notes yeah and i want to check guys. it out too i know so. yeah. yeah it's a whole album nice awesome all right well let's move on to some more of josh's music <laughs> yeah yeah so the next track is Whoa. a josh picked track uh, <laughs> and this is called outspaced and we'll be oh, right no. back <laughs> You just heard Out Space, composed by Josh Mansell for Crash Bandicoot 2. This, uh, you know, I, I think, Josh, I, I realized that you like to combine that really crunchy tuba with that high, that high fluttering flute. I think that's like your, your signature for this, <laughs> for the soundtrack. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things I really liked about this track was that it was very dynamic and it was it was also kind of a little little spooky a little creepy in the beginning and um, sinister yeah yeah sinister and it had a 
Fantasia feel to me. It was very epic and like big That's crashes really and good point. waves yeah. and things moving. And it was a very, uh, it reminds me not only of the sound of Fantasia, but even like gives me like visuals of like this organized chaos, like lots of stuff going on and kind of like you go now and okay, it's your turn and like, you know, lots of stuff. Mickey was, pointing at the yeah. different things. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I totally get the Fantasia vibe. Yeah. Some of that mimetic, you know, you can imagine the cacophony going around. Like it's sort of old film. I, I, I say this a lot now, but old film score, it just has the, the music sort of representing what the sound is doing instead of actually just sound effects. And it really has that effect. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can see that for sure. Yeah. Tell us about Outspaced. Uh, that's a rejected demo for the, uh, the, the ro- what's it called? Rocket, the jetpack. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I can I see. Called, I can see yeah. how that was. Pack maybe, attack. Maybe, maybe uh, n- not. Maybe not the best placement for that that level, but uh, it's a great track. And and this wasn't reused for anything else. No. Um, so, I think the the first ideas were that you know you're you're floating around in space, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so there was a little bit of a, a tip of the hat to 2001: A Space Odyssey. Right, with I can the, see that. the front half of that, there's definitely like a you know a kind of a bastardized version of the Danube Waltz or <laughs> something like that. Uh, and then the shit hits the fan, if I can say that word on sure. your show. Sure, I'll just bleep um, it out. You know, things things get re- <laughs> yeah, things get really chaotic and crazy because it's a video game, and of course it it goes too far. You know, it's like it's too I don't know what it is. It's a, it's like a too cartoony horror horror music or something well like it sounds that. like it's you just, weren't you weren't actually that um satisfied with the way it turned out yourself i think it was more of an experiment you know this was like the first time we had touched anything orchestral flavored mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that wasn't really a feature of the crash games except for like the medieval levels and crash warped right, right um which i still don't really love to this day um, they just, you know, do, doing orchestral music with, with this particular, the, with those limitations was just kind of not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, it just always sounded a little bit just terrible. <laughs> well, so that was like, um, so uh, I, I'll put a big fat asterisk next to that because what ended up being the music for Pack Attack um, is orchestral flavored and the, the, the Crash fans seem to really like it a lot. And it, it's an, I, I think it's, it's kind of a cool piece. Um, it's maybe a little bit more of an even, evenly paced version of what you heard. Uh-huh. Right. Um, you know, there's definitely like a, it sort of builds and it does get chaotic and there's like orchestral flourishes and runs, but it's not quite as like, you know, running through the haunted house on fire or whatever. It's like, <laughs> you know, maybe just a little bit more like outer space action music. Or gotcha. Something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Nice. So, yeah. So next up we have a demo called Snow Go and we'll <laughs> listen to that and we'll... <laughs> You get a little chuckle, so I'm sure oh, we're yeah. in for something good. Snow so. go. All right. <laughs> Let's listen to Snow go and we'll be right back.
kind of like when uh, somebody hands you those jelly beans and there's like, here, try this one. And you're like a little they're chuckle like, and you're like, hey, hey, this hey. is booger flavor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Snowgo is definitely booger flavored. <laughs> okay, you just listened to the demo of Snowgo by Josh Mansell. I'm guessing this was a snow go for uh putting in the game either <laughs> oh sorry that was like a total dad joke um and now you know i like this track a lot oh, yeah i like this track a lot too i'm it, curious about what you're gonna say about it but it, i i liked it, it i thought it was i thought it was charming yeah it's very um <laughs> it's very gentle and reminds me of kind of like a kids like edutainment type television show or or even yeah. like a um like a gentle credits track or something like that. Like there's, it, you don't feel in danger at all, um, which is it's kind of neat. But I could see, like for a game, it could possibly not work so well. Yeah, well, you yeah, know, just there there was one thing that I noticed too. Actually, there's a, a kind of a almost like a how do you say this? Uh, like almost like a fuzz, like a like a static on the on the back, like a very low kind of hum. It, I wouldn't say static. It's it's not the recording quality, but it's almost like a like a wintry kind of like snows blowing in the in the background is that how it like was meant to sound or was that like a like a recording thing or a mastering thing yes that's exactly what it is it's the sound it's like some taken from some cartoon sound effects sound effects cd and it's like the wind blowing um i actually did that quite a bit on on a lot of the crash one and crash two soundtracks where i was able to find just you know ambiences actually in crash warp two i think you know i have like um underwater sounds Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, and I was able to like make really short loops, you know, where I would just take like maybe two or three seconds and just have it playing so low that it, you know, created like just another layer of ambience. Mm -hmm. So this was a demo that got rejected, and all of your, what you noticed about it, I, I would I would tend to agree with it, it. It was supposed to sound like a, like a kind of an old skating rink type song. Mm, um, yeah, okay. I don't know if you guys grew up ice skating but we, um, we had ice skating yeah, rings I did a little bit as a yeah. kid I mean I'm not that old so you're it's not, not like and you're not that much older than us you know yeah. we're, in our, in our, we're in our mid 30s here so oh, I actually turn 35 go. tomorrow yeah oh yeah excellent yeah, yeah. alright well I feel a little bit better now um, <laughs> you know when I was in I, I'm just going to talk about you know me and my ice skating you know it was like listening to like disco you know like do you think I'm sexy Rod Stewart you know stuff like <laughs> right that. But my, my, my version of my head of like, you know, retro skating music was mm -hmm. something more of like, you know, the Oregon player who's there playing it live. Um, and that's where that organ comes in. Oh, yeah, and I can I see just, that. You know, the level is, you know, your, your, your crash is sort of like sliding around on the ice. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember watching a video of it and, you know, it's kind of awkward. You know, it's like when you're on the ice, you kind of like you're not able to really like walk or run. It's like, you know, pretty awesome for a video game to like pull off that kind of realism. Oh, yeah. That. And his feet almost feel like they're shuffling. Like he's not really like yeah. picking them up like he's running. And then there's also the reflection that I was yeah. like so impressed with because oh, I so remember many games, we were we were both like looking yeah. at it, we're like dude you can see like everything that he's doing but yeah. like in reverse it's and crazy. everything like uh, in you know say like in PlayStation Two you'd see like Metal Gear Solid Two Snake looks in the mirror and there's nothing there there's no reflection but it's right. like back on PlayStation One, One they, they were, were doing it like was a beautiful reflection and but stuff. yeah well, it was let's a really think, pretty level let's let's think about that for a second. Um, <laughs> I mean, that is, I mean, that's kind of what I was inspired by. It was like kind of like a, a beautiful thing to look at mm -hmm. and the whole like, you know, kind of like shuffling around, like you said, um, that's, that's what I thought of. I just thought like, okay, well maybe this is not like some super cartoony. I mean, it's still cartoony. It definitely has that, like what you said, the, the old educational film vibe to it. And I thought it was really funny, like and I turned it in and like everyone was just like, what are you, what is this? Like, what the hell is this? This is not Crash Bandicoot. This is not funny. And I was just like, all right. So I, you know, I get to strike out every once in a while. So that's what that was. And I just think it, it's a, it's a pretty complete, I mean, I kind of wish that there was a game for that, for that piece of music, mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe there is out there somewhere, but you know, it's just supposed to sound like a bad piece of like roller uh, ice skating you know muzak basically so yeah it's like it's awesome funny though. because it's like uh it's like the crazy juxtaposition and not that it's like uh you know like sometimes you hear game music or you know other kind of music where it's it's too like on point like this sounds right. like you're in a volcano this sounds like you're <clears> in a, you know on like a like lots of 
thematic levels like that, like ice levels, uh, like right. lava levels, all this stuff have that very much. Then you see something that it's a little bit different and it stands out, but I guess they weren't really... They weren't really too vibing. keen on that vibe. Yeah, so um, I know we're, we're, we're kind of going long here, but I have one more track from Crash 2 I really want to play. Is that is it okay? Do we still have time to do one more from Crash 2? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Uh, I there's, there's a track I really like. It's Coco's Theme. Are you, you guys, oh. you get, yeah, are you guys cool if we play that? Yeah, I'm down. I'm, I'm down. <laughs> All right. Mm. So this is Coco's theme from Crash Bandicoot 2 on the Sony PlayStation, composed by Mo- jo- composed. I was going to say, but composed by me. Why, why would I say that? <laughs> composed by Josh Mansell. And uh, we'll take a listen. We'll be right back. just heard Coco's theme composed by Josh Mansell for Crash Bandicoot 2. I really, really like this track. I I, 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 lo- I love this track so much. That's why I was like, can we guys, can we sneak <laughs> this one in? Um, it's it's really mellow. It's got kind of this um, almost laid back island feel to it. A little surf rock in there. Uh, just an overall, like I put this track on a lot. Like I listen to this one a lot. I don't know what mm-hmm. it is. I just, I, I really like it. And then you hear this, this kind of like harmonica just like go yeah. off in the background just kind of like randomly not expecting it and it just i don't know it just feels good i feel happy it makes it a feel good track yeah. yeah you know something i really like about this track and, and it's something i've noticed in a lot of the music is there's this sort of collage feel where the sections come in that don't necessarily they don't you know they they have different sounds and they have a different timbre and it's like oh this is a fast part followed by a slow part but it really works in this tra- i mean it works in a lot of tracks but i think it just works marvelously here yeah, I think this one, like you said, it has all these different parts to it, but they don't invoke like chaos or like um, stress at all. This one still, even though with all the different parts popping up, they're unexpected. It still has like a very soothing and kind of a, um, almost like relaxing, like islandy feel to the whole track. That dun 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 dun, dun. Yeah. and it fits into like that the fast. it fits into like the the overall style that. Crash Bandicoot songs have kind of have like with the lots of craziness, but this one, like I said, is not like crazy. This is, it, this is a, a very laid back, but it's still, yeah, it still carries that that crash feel. Totally, totally. Josh, um, can you tell us your thoughts about uh, Coco's theme? Well, it, uh, once again, this is on my CD, it's listed as Sister. So that's, <laughs> that's what we called it, Sister. What can I say about this? Um, I don't, I mean, this is not, you don't really hear this in the game. You know, it plays behind the Coco hologram. So it's not part of a level. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I th- I may have n- known that going into it. And so I think maybe, the, I mean, I'm totally guessing here because this was 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. <laughs> um, maybe the order was to like, you know, do something that was like pretty, you know, restrained, I guess. Um, and so maybe that's why it has kind of that mellow vibe. Um, but when I listen to it, I mean, the first thing I think of is, oh, Stuart Copeland. And I'm not talking about Spyro. I'm talking about like me growing up listening to the police. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. Okay. 
you know, you listen to the drum programming on that one and the Ruins level. I mean, the Ruins level was definitely a deliberate, like, I'm going to write a Stuart Copeland professional <laughs> drum track. Right, right, right. And um, so I definitely hear it all over that one. I mean, there's definitely like that kind of like, even though the police didn't really do like a uh, mellow reggae, they did more of a punked up reggae. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I could definitely hear a lot of that going on there. As far as the collage aspect, that's definitely in full effect. I mean, it's almost like too much. Like it's t- for me anyway. It's just kind of like, where is this thing going? Just, <laughs> um, you know, maybe it's for the best that it got buried under the Coco dialogue or whatever. But you know, it's it's interesting. It definitely has like. I think this is maybe what how I wanted the Tana theme to sound like on the first game. Um, so I went back to that. Mm-hmm, you know, the mm-hmm. Tana uh, theme on the first game also has like a kind of a yeah sort of like a sl- ska thing. Right, right going anyway yeah that's a it's an interesting tune <laughs> yeah this is a good one we had to pick that one yeah <laughs> now earlier i asked you about um how doing these these tracks that you know pushed you as uh, to try new things uh, stylistically and stuff like that now did it push you to venture out and to find new influences that maybe you weren't quite listening to before or dig deeper into the type of music that you were already into um because you keep referencing, uh, saying all these specific artists that you were referencing and, and that you liked Copeland and were kind of emulated and, then, and stuff like that. So I didn't know if maybe uh, it puts you to try some new or to like um, like listen harder at some of the stuff you already were really into. Well, I listen to a lot of music and I always have. And it's always like, I mean, different styles, different, you know, like all the time. And I'm always absorbing different elements. And I, I will, I mean, even listening to that, that snow go demo I was just like oh i i know that there was like an element of me listening to this one special song called do nothing where there's like this roller or i keep on saying roller rink but it's like an ice rink mm-hmm. type organ and i know that that's what i was trying to go for just that element not the song but just i want that sound i want that kind of rolling sound mm-hmm. but to get back to your question um I've said this in other interviews, and I, I, def, I wholeheartedly believe that the number one influence on all this music was literally like the game itself, and like what I was looking at, and like, and anything that else that came into the music was not really that deliberate, and it was more just sort of like I had absorbed, you know, oh, I listened to this Stereo Lab album today, and I paid attention to like the way the bass sounded, like this picked bass kind of sound, and I was mm-hmm. like, oh, I, so I, I just kind of cherry pick different elements without even really like being super aware um, of it. Yeah. It's just something, you know, I I just kind of listened to a lot of different stuff and it all kind of finds, finds its way in there somehow. Yeah. So for me, it's always interesting because like I've mentioned before, I come from a little bit of a creative background and it's always interesting when people that don't kind of try to understand where like inspiration and stuff like that comes from. And a lot of times it's, it is something like, oh, I saw this somewhere and it influenced me in this way. And most people feel like it's just inspiration just happens. And it's like, oh, I just made this up out of nowhere. And it, it happens sometimes, but... Uh, so indeliberate. People and feel kind of like cheated almost when they hear that. They're just like, oh, so this other person helped give you this idea. And it's like, well, kind of, but it's still new. <laughs> like, yeah, it just yeah. kind of floated into my ear and then kind of some of it stuck and some of it didn't. Yeah. I mean, what's what's kind of interesting about the um, working on the Crash games is, or I guess with a lot of video games, I don't know that um, having a, a temp score is is part of the process all the time. Uh, do you know what I mean by a temp score? I, I like, do. Well, I'm sure yeah. Gene does. Yeah. He's, he's a he's a composer. But <laughs> uh, enlighten enlighten us and the the listeners who who aren't familiar. Well, if you're you know if you if you if you're lucky enough to get a film gig. Chances are the director and the editor, or maybe even the music editor, have already sat down and sort of mapped out what kind of music they want throughout the film. Uh, you know, they'll take other soundtrack music, or they'll take, you know, a song or something, and they'll oh, just sort of like just you know to to like sort of you know make everyone happy and make them feel like they're you know working on a real like this movie is the, or whatever. This is the direction we want it to go, kind right. of thing, right? Exactly, and it's it can it's it, it can be very helpful to composers, and it can also drive them crazy because once people you know get used to watching their own you know creation or their own choices, you know the magic of sound and vision taking place before their eyes, it's hard for them to get out of like you know it's called temp love. I can see mm-hmm. I can see that. 
Yeah, which I, is not what the composer has. <laughs> um, <right. it's> what, <laughs> I've heard some funny stories about this, where the composer will, or with the the director will put something in, like uh, try to make it sound exactly like Led Zeppelin, but don't rip them off and get us into any hot water. But I want it to be exactly like this track. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that happens every every single second of every single day. <laughs> uh, in fact, that's what a lot of commercial work is like. You know, a lot of commercials are sold internally to to the higher ups you know thinking like okay this is gonna have this sort of it's gonna sound just like this song which everyone loves and then you know when it comes time to budget it out it's like they don't have you know the money for it unless it's like a you know high profile super bowl spot or whatever right right um and then they're like hey i like this other song better and it's like well you couldn't afford that song so (laughs) right (laughs) yeah it's part of the part of the part of the game you know part of the gig right (laughs) Anyways, so we've talked about the first two games. We've still got one more game left that we want to chat about. This is Crash Bandicoot Warped, and it was released on October 31st of 1998, so a few years after. And this actually made a big splash, I think. This was uh, supposed to be like more like badass more hardcore there was you know even crash in the in the uh on the cover <laughs> he's he's, he's, he's got sunglasses and, and he's on a harley yeah flames like, yeah with flames and it's it's just like like warped you know like a- any like kind of buzzword that you can use is really um that was definitely you know, like in the air in the late 90s oh, that whole, like, yeah e- extreme sports and all that junk it was just like exactly oh God. exactly and so they were, they were really marketing that way and this was again you know developed by naughty dog published by sony Directed by Jason Rubin and programmed by Andy Gavin, so like the original guys are still working on the yeah. same the same thing uh, a few years later, and I think that um, this one actually took um, a little bit of a different approach, right? Uh, as far as the gameplay, I mean, it's it's basically the same game, but with some extra stuff added in. Yeah, I mean, in in a lot of ways, it's very similar to the second game. The theme has changed a little bit, but just like the second game, it takes place right after, or just like the second place took place right after the first this one takes place right after the second and the neocortex space station the cortex vortex crashes on earth and unleashes your companion your buddy aku aku's evil brother uka uka who joins forces with cortex and entropy as they're trying to gather more crystals scattered throughout the world to take it over and so crash and coco have to travel through time to take the crystals back from cortex before they before they collect them all. So in a lot of ways, yeah, the, you know, it's the same sort of structure. You have five areas, each with five stages, about 25 crystals, five bosses. There's a few extra things added, like a double jump and a super belly flop move. Right, and, right. Know, I forgot about that. There's some new vehicle stages, which use a different game engine. There's airplane stages, jet ski stages, and motorcycle stages. And the airplane stages are actually like you know, sort of behind the back, flying the plane in in more of like an arcadey mm-hmm. kind yeah. of right, right, more like a like, like a, a Diddy Kong racing or yeah, kind of exactly. Thing. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you're returning fire with the enemies. In it's a much more arcadey experience. I mean, the the games are very you know arcadey already, but it's a little bit of a different flavor. And you also get to ride a little baby T Rex and travel yeah. through all sorts of different places, like. The Great Wall of China, ancient Egypt, uh, medieval area. There's an underwater area. A whole bunch of different places. There's a, yeah. a, a, they really expanded on uh, the the levels and the level design. I think there's a lot more field of view too. Yeah, it, and so you can you can really uh, get a, a like a larger sense of space. I right. think in this in this third iteration. Well, and it's it's interesting if you compare it to the third one to the first one. It's a huge, massive change. It feels very different. But if you look at them in progression. Uh, a lot of this, it feels very much like they definitely built upon two. They right, took it to right, the next right. level. You got to go bigger. You got to have more. So it's still kind of like the the portal theme from the second game. But now you're going further and farther, and you know now you're going back in time and forwards in time. So it's right. like it's it's the next evolution. It seems it seems like it fits and it feels right. Right, and they kept the the whole idea of the you know crates that you have to smash right and getting yeah. the the what is it aku aku mask and right and even like the hog felt like a vehicle level and the you're riding the baby polar bear in the second one and you know so like those elements don't seem too out there right but the it, third one but then look at it and you're playing it um because i played it directly after the second one and it feels like a major upgrade even though a lot of those gameplay elements are really still 
there. They're just kind of enhanced, I guess, if mm-hmm. you will. Yeah, there's some really subtle things. Like the graphics just look a little bit better. But if you sort of compare them straight, it doesn't really look that different. But there's, yeah, there's more, there's more things on the screen. The models are a little bit nicer. I don't know. I just... I, you you pick is, up on it very, very I, subtly. I yeah. think the second and third game were on the same game engine too. Yeah. So maybe it was right. just got to know the game engine a little bit more time, it, it, yeah. reuse things. So right. But Who knows? Know, all in all, I thought it was a, a really cool game. When I first saw it as a kid, I thought like the the marketing of it, like the over like badass look. I it I was a little bit surprised that it was still made by the same people. It wasn't like yeah. a spinoff, like, yeah. oh, we're going to make a third game, but it's like different developers or something yeah. like that. But I was you know, surprised that I really liked it. Yeah. Sonic is hardcore. We got to make Crash a little bit more edgy. So we put him on, <laughs> yeah. you know, put him in shades and on a hog. And then, you know, I think, I think we got it. He's always riding hogs. Yeah. So. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, so let's get into some music. So the first track uh, that we got is uh, a track that Gene picked. Well, actually, we haven't played the theme yet. Oh, oh we haven't played the theme? Right. Oh, let's start with the theme then. So this is the theme from Crash Bandicoot Warped, and we'll be right back. That was the theme from Crash Warped on the Sony PlayStation, composed by Josh Mansell. Now, I think with each iteration of the game, each sequential game, that, uh, what is it, harp or piano slide gets a little bit longer. <laughs> I, I really like this. This uh, I like the second theme probably the most, but this uh, is still, um, it just it feels it feels bigger than, yeah. than before. It's very theatrical. It's kind of over the, over the top and um, lots of stuff going on. It's really cool. Yeah. Uh, Gene, what do you what do you think about this track? Well, I actually probably spent the most time listening to the third soundtrack for whatever reason. I just really vibed with the sound, just the sound palette that you picked for this one. So, uh, I mean, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about it, but I really enjoyed the third one a lot. Well, it, it, there's definitely a lot of variations with the levels. You know, I mean, I think that's that's always wh- where you can look to to find, you know, like I said, where all the inspiration comes from. Mm-hmm. So. Um, you know, just the exotic locations, the time travel element, it, it goes pretty far and wide. So as far as the theme goes, I actually don't know why this one has sort of become the unofficial, like, overall crash theme. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's like the easiest to play or something. I don't know. It's like, <laughs> um, I, I really don't have too many memories of writing it, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, you know, it just kind of felt like, okay, I mean... It, here I am like speculating again but I think that there, there was they did want the theme uh, repeating throughout the game mm-hmm. in some ways so you know how the, the danger levels or the skull routes or whatever they're called mm-hmm. um, they kind of reference the theme song so maybe there was like some attention put to that like okay well what's going to sound good with multiple you know with different instrument setups and, and whatnot. but I, I actually can't remember too much so <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I thought it was a great track, but let's uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next track. This is Neo Cortex from Crash Bandicoot Warped.
<laughs> How was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> this part I like. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that. The rest of it's wonky, man. Well, you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you think. We loved it. <laughs> <laughs> that was just so ridiculous. Oh, that was uh, Neo Cortex, composed by Josh Mansell for Crash Bandicoot Warped on the Sony PlayStation. You know, I have to say, I, I I heard. I don't know if we caught what you were saying. I think it works in its favor that it is sort of over the top and ridiculous. I mean, it's yeah. the third game. It sounds like a showdown with all of those guitar tracks. It's like a wild, wild west kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, I picked up on that twangy like cowboy, and I feel like that actually even feels a little bit of like a, a running theme. Like the twanginess of some of the stuff is very uh, crash to crash me. Crash sounding, uh, yeah, because yeah. ha- that can kind of like work towards like some of the like uh, tribal like um, backcountry like hillbilly like, like it's aboriginal like, kind yeah of like thing. i feel like um you know if if crash were someone he would be like a uh, um, australian hillbilly <laughs> like yeah, type, type person thing. and and um th- there was a lot of those themes that I, I feel like i've picked up on a few of the other tracks whether it be some of the instruments or even some of the little riffs that are thrown in here and there i, I still feel like even the music even though it's a lot more over the top and and crazy it's still feels like it fits into the the overall theme of crash well the cortex theme was um i I think the only one that actually well no no no. there were other themes that sort of evolved with each game but if you listen to the cortex themes from crash one two and three um you can hear similar elements like the twangy guitar is actually in all three that um that moog bass that kind of goes through a filter yeah yeah that's um that's in all three um, so I did try to have a little bit of, you know, some cohesion to those mm-hmm. to those themes throughout. You know, I didn't really pick up on that, uh, that, you know, I, I was thinking more along the lines of, you know, different kind of themes that were, you know, reused and reintroduced and stuff. Um, but I didn't think about the instruments that were brought over to capture that, that same kind of feeling. And uh, so it's interesting you bring that up. Yeah, the the brio has the the kind of the fake theremin, the the ripper roo themes from Crash One and Crash Two have some. I can't remember. I think it's like a harmonica or a melodica or something. You know, all these tunes kind of <laughs> <laughs> like it, when I'm listening to them, then I can talk about them. But it's like you know, trying to go back and remember exactly which one. Oh yeah, know, yeah. What, when, but like uh, definitely the cortex. Yeah, the the cortex theme definitely. I, I tried to carry some stuff from th- from theme to theme. Yeah, and I, so. I think as a kid, I I kind of picked up on that with just like the whole series. I think that's one of the reasons why I like the Crash series, even though uh, I can't really pick one game over the other. But they all feel like one long game. Right. And and then even like the you know Crash himself, and then like the environments and the look and feel, and even the sound always kind of felt like. They always went together, and there were elements that were borrowed from earlier games and later games, and so it. I like that cohesion with this series. Right. Well, think about the production schedule too. I mean, like the first four Crash games happened four years in a row. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. That's right. That's kind of um, you know, it's, Im- it's a lot. I think it's impressive, and um, I mean, I don't want to speak too too much to the to, to the development side, but I I know that they were. You know, there are a lot of things that couldn't fit into the previous game that they already had built. So if there's, you know, any sort of, like, um, familiarity or something that ties in in some ways, you know, I'm, I'm sure they, the whole choice. thing was like, you know, they had a big soup going of elements. And um, even, like, the Komodo Brothers theme, um, that was supposed to be in, in Crash 1, except it was just Komodo Joe. Oh, um, okay. Mm. So I, I think I posted one of the demos I did for Komodo Joe which has nothing to do with where it ended up it's actually a really dumb piece of music but <laughs> um, <laughs> whatever you know all, yeah all this stuff kind of uh, flies around you know yeah no, that, that makes sense why don't we get into another track Gene what do we got the next track we have is Entropy also from Crash 3 Warped
That was Entropy from Crash 3 Warped on the Sony PlayStation, composed by Josh Mansell. I love this track. It's so weird. Oh, yeah, so it's, it's bizarre. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's like a sound design. It, it is definitely a techno track that turned more almost into a rock track in a way, like just from the beat, but... I could definitely hear your techno influences front and center on yeah, this one. Gina, it's, this is the one you picked, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one actually has um, some of it is looped, uh, you know, like drum loop stuff or elements of a drum loop, and some of it's, you know, programmed to go with it. Um, something that I forgot to say about the, the Cortex, I'm just going to backtrack for a second, but yeah. Um, yeah. when I listen to this stuff, I can definitely hear um, um, Metallica as like sort of a weird hidden influence so the, the the drumming like Lars Ulrich like some of those patterns and like mm-hmm. the double bass use and I know that double bass is all over metal or whatever but I'm definitely like you know with a few exceptions a, a, a big Metallica fan and I can definitely hear some of that rhythmic sensibility happening anyway I, I guess I can I guess I can see some of that too yeah, that's I, yeah. Like, come clean on that you know the closet <laughs> metal head you know um, but you know the entropy is definitely like has a techno vibe to it yeah, it's so. such a, such a bizarre track. When yeah. Gene Gene picked this one, and he's like, he sent it over, and I looked at it, and I and I and I listened to. It. I mean, I heard it before, but I really listened to it uh, again, just you know, over the last week. And every time I hear it, it changes, and uh, it just sounds. There's like more to listen to. Yeah, there's shine. more to listen to. It just it, it grows on you, and it's it's like creepy but cool, but like yeah. daring, but like it, I it's, liked that. Uh, it almost sounded like a playing uh, on the ribs of like a dinosaur or something like that like <laughs> like a bone xylophone or something yeah yeah well this is the the level where he's got the big tuning fork right 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 right, right. Yeah. and you're trying to like avoid i mean that was definitely like a big influence on some of the the way the beats come down with that you know like has like kind of a weird like roll leading into it yeah that was definitely like i was looking at like how that how that tuning fork hit the ground and like the way that the camera kind of shakes uh, and like, I see. so that was another like, okay, I'm going to add some of this into the track and maybe like one out of every 18 times you play it, it'll actually sync up and mm-hmm. it'll look really cool. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. I didn't even think of it like that. I have a question though. Yes. Um, do you have any, you know how the, the, the xylophone has a, a different quality to it? Mm-hmm. 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 Um, sure. Did that come across in the console mixes? I can't remember. I think so. I, I I never I never noticed anything really different. I mean, obviously the sample quality and stuff is a lot better in the pre console mixes, but the, I never noticed anything out of the ordinary with the the um, PlayStation mixes. I think no. that was one of the the few times I actually put like a specific effect other than reverb on an instrument, mm-hmm. um, just because I I knew that they were all going to get knocked down to one one note samples. And for some reason, I wanted to use a mallet instrument, but it just it, it had to sound artificial and weird sounding. And so I was experimenting with like different. Um, I had like a um, God, what was it? Like a Boss SE50 effects unit, which is just like a rack mount effects thing. And I, I remember shuttling through like all the presets, and then I finally landed on something that kind of had this weird like metallic quality. And um, that's why the the xylophone sounds like I, I was. Someone made a comment about how they heard all these like overtones in the in the xylophone part, and I'm just like, oh, I wonder if that actually translated in the console because it's kind of a specific effect. Anyway. Well, you know, well, uh, no, you know, like now that I, I think about it, I'm pretty sure it did because I I had listened to all, like pretty much all of these tracks like a lot. Uh, what uh, you know was ripped from the PlayStation version. And I would have noticed I would have noticed that being overly different, but we're, we're probably gonna have to. Well, yeah, we'll have to go back and listen to it. I mean, after the show, but it, I I think it came across. I, I only ever really noticed the PlayStation mixes being a little crunchier, more compressed. But I think the general character's still there. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Got it. All right. Let's get into our next track. This is a track Josh picked for us. It's called Future Frenzy from Crash Bandicoot Warped on the PlayStation.
That was Future Frenzy from Crash 3 Warped, composed by Josh Mansell on the Sony PlayStation. I really like this this track. Um, so for Crash 3, I probably played the least out of all three of the games. Me, me so, too, me too. Uh, I'm like, uh, the the music doesn't bring up as much from no. the game. So like right. my mind is kind of able to kind of wander. And this the beginning of this song reminds me of like a Prince song from <laughs> like the one that's, I don't know if you guys watched the uh, Tim Burton Batman where uh, Joker's in the museum and they're like painting all the pieces. Oh, and, and, yeah, and it's yeah, like a yeah. song that's so different. Party from, man. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. so different from the movie. And then like it had to be introduced by that like He's walking around with the boombox, and but then later on, it kind of reminds me of like Vector Man a little bit, like that industrial I, yeah. kind of like techno-y feel. I thought it was really cool. I I like the both of those, uh, ref, like the those are very good references for me. I like mm-hmm. them, but um, the track, all in all, was really cool. I liked it a lot. I, I like that there is a lot of. I mean, it's you know future frenzy, so there's gonna have, or there's, there's gonna be that kind of future kind of sound or vibe or instruments, but it really it really kind of even the percussion line has almost like a like a piston almost like a like a mechanical sound to it and then you get the phasers and and all sorts of these you know the um that like i don't am i making that noise correctly <laughs> yeah. uh, yes you are uh, yeah you could just sample me next time <laughs> and, um, <laughs> next time next time <laughs> and uh no I, I i i really like this track and i think that it 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 really kind of captures that that future sound you know what this reminds me of um splatoon uh splatoon oh, okay, yeah. 2 and it has that kind of you know that kind of futuristic kind of um like squirty kind of right vibe I, I liked it a lot i really wish there would be a next time like uh, i mean i love like uncharted and last of us and stuff but i really wish that N- naughty, naughty dog, dog would, would make go back like another jack and daxter or like a whole new crash but you know i don't know but that, that would be great but yeah i like those kind of fun like games and so the overly serious like crazy stuff yeah, well, I don't that's know. that's the way things have gone for sure. I mean, I, there's, I mean, I, I've there, there are all sorts sorts of like casual games out there that kind of approach that level of fun. I think, but mm-hmm. um, as far as like the big scale ones, you're right. It's kind of sort of like a lost lost art form, right? Yeah. So, in some ways. Why did why did you pick Future Frenzy? Well, to me, I mean, it it it, it sounds like a clear descendant of um, you know the heavy machinery. You know, mm-hmm. similar sort of vibe there. Um, if I remember correctly, you're sort of on a conveyor belt on this level. Is that right? And you're like, I you a- don't remember on this one. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're like, it's like a, a city, like basically like kind of a Blade Runner ish. Maybe not quite as grim. I'm trying, obviously, I'm trying but, to remember um, this level. Anyway, it's definitely like a you know you're in the future and it's it's all supposed to be kind of tech sounding or whatever. Um, so it was another case of just you know looking at the visuals, kind of. Picking instruments that would sound appropriate to that, you know, and there's always that that craftwork influence happening with a lot of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I, I mean, I could hear. I mean, if, even though I'm not like a big Nine Inch Nails fan, I always ah uh, you know, yeah, I, I can I, see. I, 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 I can really see don't. It. I don't know too much of their stuff, but I, I always liked. He always had the best sounds, though. I just oh, didn't like, big time. I didn't just didn't like his music that much, or his <laughs> vocals, or something. I couldn't deal with all his angst or whatever. <laughs> but killer sounds, right? I mean, like the yeah. guy. I mean, actually, I, I, I. This is maybe you want to edit this out, but when I first moved to LA, I had a friend that worked at Interscope, and he took me up to Trent Reznor's house um, while they were doing a video shoot, and so I got to like. You know, when they were done, we were all hanging out. So I was hanging out with my friend and maybe about five other people with Trent Reznor and and Marilyn Manson before he was Marilyn. Or actually, I think he had the band Marilyn Manson, but he was just, you know, it was my friend Brian from Ohio. <laughs> um, but, you know, my, my, my fanboy was just like, man, where do you get those sounds? Anyway. Wow. Wow, I, I, why blah, would blah, I want? Blah. Why would I want to edit that out? That's that's awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah, get those wonderful sounds. Exactly. Brew. But good call. On, good call on the Prince, though. I mean, that definitely. Like, I I put in a lot of time with that Batman soundtrack. Um, it's not one of Prince's best albums, but there's some great ear candy on it. Oh yeah. Um, and the first song is called "The Future," so there you go. I mean, it's <laughs> like it's all there. You nailed it, James. Well, and even like a lot of Prince songs, kind of have that like. Uh, Kind of like choppy. You don't really know, like uh, not collagey, but kind of like that. Like there's some songs where you, they're very unexpected. I I love Prince. 
I mean, yeah. I really, I mean, that's a whole other show. You could, I could talk about <laughs> Prince for like, you know, another three hours or whatever. Um, anyway, so I'm sure that some of that seeped in there. Yeah. You know, we're, we're talking about the music today and, uh, you know, we're kind of gushing over it, but like, it's not like we're the only ones. I mean, this was, the, the soundtracks for the games were so well loved. I mean, it's 20 years later and people still talk about this music and still and well, still really enjoy it it just got re- you know the game is still loved i mean it's just got re-released right 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 so was there any sense that like you know you're writing this music 20 years ago you're a young guy were you thinking at all at the time did this th- is this music that i'm writing gonna resonate with people all these years later or is it just like i have no idea if anybody's gonna even like it at all um it was tough to say i mean i i definitely had the feeling that it was like a pretty gonna be fairly high profile you know, I didn't really have a, a real sense of what the gaming is, industry was all about back then. And I mean, truthfully, the gaming industry was sort of in transition anyway. You know, I mean, right. mm-hmm. I've, I've heard people refer to this this whole era as like the, the turbulent ad- adolescent period of the gaming industry. And I sort of get it. You know, there were a lot of big ideas being tossed around and just the technology didn't support it. I right, mean, earlier right. when, when you were talking about the, the crash story. Mm-hmm. You know that no one really knew, or they, you know, none of we we're. I mean, I was sitting here shrugging my shoulders too. Um, <laughs> just the whole idea of having like a real story-driven game was like kind of not a thing. I mean, like yeah. maybe you could like you could tell a story just going from level to level, or maybe you know, there's some Mario stories. I mean, I, I, I don't know, but you see where we're at now. And you look at yeah. where Naughty Dog took the whole thing, and it's like it's absolutely story driven, you know. Right. right? Well, yeah. So, I mean, during this time, it was like the the predecessors with like the you know the NES and the Genesis and Super Nintendo, all that stuff. Like, it was not uncommon to only tell a story in the game manual and right. not have any of that in the game at all. And right. so, even though some games on the PlayStation started trying to push that. But there were a lot like this that didn't. And if you didn't read the manual, you didn't know. So right. uh, so it, it was kind of like the beginning stages. Like everything is kind of right. ugly again uh, with the low poly yeah. and trying to figure everything out. But it was exciting and cool. And a right. lot of games during the era didn't age very well. They really yeah. didn't. Some of them didn't, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. But some of them have that new, like, I love it because it's so ugly. <laughs> yeah. You know what really <laughs> summarizes this for me is, I, it was probably like last year when the most recent Uncharted came out, the very beginning has you sitting down on the couch playing the first Crash with your wife. Like, right. the game narrative is you going back and playing this 20-year-old game being like almost like, oh, it's, you know, look at this silly old game. It's It's ridiculous, but... That's just how far things have come in the last twenty yeah. something years. Well, so right. they're nodding back to their beginnings. Oh yeah, right, right. So, uh, out of all the uh, the games, all the music we played uh, today, what was your favorite? What would be you know considered your favorite track that you've done for the the series? Well, we didn't play it. We didn't play <laughs> it. Well, what track is it? Dingo Dial. Well, we're getting to that. Oh, oh yeah, we've got, we've got <laughs> that's saved. Yeah. Yeah. Well, say that's what? great. That's great because uh, you know our next track that we're gonna play is called Dingo Dial, and this you is... guys are so nice. You're being too nice. <laughs> <laughs> and it says RM in the title that you gave me. What does RM stand for? Oh, oh, remaster. <laughs> it oh, stands remaster. for re- oh, but oh, gotcha. like not not in the way that people misuse the term for. For game remasters, it's it's actually, I mean, with these pre-console mixes, I don't just rip them straight off the CD. I, I do put them in my computer, and I will do a little bit of EQ adjustment. And, oh, I see. Uh, I, I might have even, like, added a touch of reverb to one of them just overall. I mean, they're just stereo mixes, but mm-hmm. right. I think when I when I first started doing this, I would, I would tag them as RM, as, you know... They've been remastered, so to speak. Awesome. So let's take a listen to Dingo Dial RM, and uh, we'll be here, and we'll be right back.
Use her Dingo Dial RM by Josh Mansell. I loved this track so much. We put it at the end. We didn't know it was Josh's <laughs> favorite track. Yeah. And we put it at the end because we thought this track was amazing. So it was a great way to uh, kind of take us out of the show as yeah. well. So that wasn't like a uh, like scripted, like, oh, we know this is his favorite. Like, <laughs> uh, no. I was like, he said, well, we didn't play my favorite track. And I was like, wait a minute, what? Yeah. <laughs> then, then I, we scrolled. I scrolled down in our notes. And I was, I was secretly is. hoping that you were going to say Dingo Dial. <laughs> Anyways, uh, no, fantastic track. Uh, kind of a return of the didgeridoo, and I think that you know speaks to the the crash world. This uh, this track though is uh, it's incredible. It's a it's a fantastic uh, track uh, all the way around, and I think the um, yeah the the banjo parts, the horn parts, everything just really works well together, and it's just it's fun. It's still got the uh, the surf rock kind of vibe too yeah the stars aligned in this track mm-hmm. i feel the same way for some reason it just like everything came together and it to me it, it feels a lot more organic than a lot of the other crash tunes and i don't know if it's because of the saxophone or something about it just kind of makes it feel more like a rock band playing mm-hmm. but once again apparently this is not a very hard boss round so who said oh my god i've never listened to the whole thing because i was so, I, I killed the I boss was, in a minute exactly yeah. over and done in 10 seconds so man we've come full circle to papu papu with the <laughs> animatronic you know oh geez villain on a stick you know yeah wow anyway that's cool it's really cool. I'm glad you uh, you uh, asked us to to put this one in because this we would have picked it anyway. You know, it's right it's a really great track. Oh, so you know, one thing we did want to ask actually that um, is is kind of about your your kind of future moving forward is what kind of projects are you working on these days and what kind of stuff do you have planned if you if you can talk about yeah. it? Yeah, um, mostly um, film stuff. Um, I've done a couple of TV things, but um, I just finished working on a film called The Wake of Light which is an independent film. And so that's going to go go forward as far as uh, the director's going to submit it to film festivals and awesome. you know, Very cool. hope for that. And then I've actually been doing a lot of volunteer work with a really great organization called Education Through Music LA. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've been helping out with their music program. Oh, that's elementary, awesome. Elementary schools kind of taking it full circle, you know, being a percussion coach for a bunch of fifth graders, so. Oh, that's awesome! That's way a lot cool. of, a lot of karma coming my way. As yeah, as yeah. <laughs> you know, going going back to how you started. Inspire though, the like, next yeah. generation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean that was you like well, thirty years ago, forty yeah. years ago. Well, that's why I said let's get those karma coming back. Yeah, Little kids run around was, wild and <laughs> yep, not doing their homework. And <laughs> oh no, dropping their drumsticks and making everyone crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Drummers are hellions, so. Um, yeah, like but it's, a re- it's a really great ec- organization and to kind of go back to where I started uh, this interview you know when I was growing up I was really lucky to have that at my disposal you know to have like a, a music program just built into my school right um, and that's not the case especially here in LA so uh, this organization um, takes their program to um, you know the public schools that are less fortunate, and right, right. Um, you know it's just it's not it's not a given to have a music program. So this yeah. actually incorporates it into their their regular curriculum. It's not an after school thing, even though there is like an after school extension. But um, you know it's a it's a regular music class that the kids take. That's um, that's very week. cool. That's very cool. Yeah, I mean we're all of of the age that you know schools were very different back when we were in school like you went to art class you went to music class you had you know all this stuff and then yeah it's it's always sad to hear when things are getting cut back and to be able yep. to be in a position to help give back is amazing i mean i, I think time. that's got to feel yeah. great yeah so i've been doing that and i've also been doing um on the the older end of the education scale i've been doing a lot of um classroom visits and lectures and i did a um a lecture as part of a panel presentation, actually with Greg Edmonds and the guy who did the music for Uncharted, um, we did a, a group presentation at UC Irvine for about 300 people, which was oh rad, r- really frightening. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, I understand that. I can I can relate to that feeling. Uh, well, there's gonna the be like thing, a lot more people listening to this episode, so at least you could take that with you next time. Uh, you know, <laughs> but the first thing I did was I threw away my notes. I was like. There's no way in hell I'm going to make it through this. And I'm going to be like, you know, with my head buried in my notes. So <laughs> anyway. Awesome. So, yes. you know, I'm, I'm keeping busy. I'm actually doing a lot of band stuff, too. Um, I'm working on a producing and mixing um, a project with my brother who wrote all the songs. And I'm 
doing a lot of overdubs and mixing for it. And my band is finishing up their second album. And nice. So there's a lot of stuff being juggled around. So yeah. awesome. Well, speaking with getting in touch with you, and then also your band stuff. Like, if someone wants to get in touch with you or check out more of your music, where where would they go? Where do you want people to go to get a hold of you? Well, SoundCloud has a lot. It has, I don't know how many tracks I've posted, probably close to 200 tracks up there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have it pretty well organized. There's a, you know, there's a Crash playlist. There's a Jack and Daxter playlist. There's an animation, commercial, film music. So that's the easiest way to listen to stuff. And it's free, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, And as far as like answering questions, I'm pretty, pretty good about um, answering correspondence either through SoundCloud or, or my Facebook music page. Awesome. I, I don't answer to everything, but um, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, th- there's there's a lot there's a lot of fans. Whenever we, um, you know, I was checking like you know different remixes for Crash Bandicoot. There's like a, a website called the OC Remix, and it's a lot of people. Doing, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, o- is that Overclock? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, and uh, there's there's a few tracks that are just uh, just very very well done uh of crash music and you know i look at the comments and people are just like oh my god i love i love this music so much and you know it just brings me back to my childhood and like this you know remix is outstanding and it just i I think um you know we were talking earlier about the you know how it resonated with people over the years i think that's just like an incredible thing it's got you got to be very proud of that i am and it's it's um i can't believe it sometimes and you know people send me stuff all the time and I, i i do listen to every single thing that people send me and i've been to your, you know what you just said i've been very impressed with stuff and taking the quirks and you know like we were talking about earlier like the you know the the style that was born of the limitations mm-hmm. and now that there's like you know an opportunity to take it out of the box and there's still something retained about it that i've i've i'm really kind of humbled by you know there's like there there is sort of a crash style that people have picked up on <laughs> for better yeah, or for worse. Yeah. You know? It's like um, oh, it's kind awesome. of it's it's really funny to hear other people's version of it sometimes because you know I, I listen to it and I go like oh that's because I didn't know how to do this or that you know it's like <laughs> you're like you know, imitating you're imitating my shortcomings you know <laughs> that's great. So, oh man, so we talked about. Uh, Crash, James mentioned earlier, you know, Crash being kind of re-released. The Insane Trilogy was published by Activision, developed by Vicarious Visions for the PS4 in 2017, and recently uh, brought to the Switch, the PC, Xbox One uh, in June. Yeah, just, last just recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it contains all three games mostly rewritten from the ga- ground up since they didn't have the original source code, and they kind of tried to faithfully recreate it as best they could, and, right. I, and apparently they did a really good job. I don't typically buy into a lot of these remasters and stuff like that neither do i i like playing the old version anyway yeah. so <laughs> that's because that's the way i remember like all the mega man yeah. games that are all coming out now and all like i ah, just play them on my nes yeah rather play it that way or you know i have the crash bandicoot game so why not play them on my playstation yep so today we covered crash bandicoot series on the playstation composed by josh mansell Josh, thank you so much for hanging out with us and chatting with us. We had a great time. Learned so much about the the music of the series. Yeah, it was a, a awesome experience for us. Thank you. We just really want to say uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This has been really interesting just to have a um, a real conversation about this stuff and. You know, hopefully I made sense. You know, sometimes <laughs> oh, yeah. I go oh, yeah, yeah. way out on the tangents, but um, well, really, you know. that's what's great about. The, there's only so much information we can look up and gleam from playing the games right. and stuff like that. So whenever we can have the composer on, we we always are excited to see what is the f- the interesting stuff that's going to pop up that we couldn't find anywhere else. And, yeah, maybe you know, nobody would know. Yeah, and we've been lucky with different episodes having stuff like that, and this one is falls right into that category. We learned all kinds of cool insight that. We just couldn't have had. Yeah. Where, where do I find the other 99 episodes? You can go to uh, our website. Well, yeah, that's actually the, the <laughs> next part in our, our, our exit is uh, yeah. if you want to know more about the show, you can find us online at pixelatedaudio.com for show notes and track lists. We can also be found on Twitter. Uh, as While we're throwing out uh, different internet findings, um, I like to play games on Twitch at Man Over Mars, and I'm going to be using that. Uh, for the show as to do uh, different art articles so uh, I did some articles a while back some people were asking if there's going to be any more so I thought it might be fun now cool that we to have, return to that yeah, yeah now that we have Gene I can take a little bit of a breather to have some room to do stuff like that and kind of mix my two passion projects together yep 
and uh, just want to say thanks to everybody. So we, what we did was we have a, a Discord server that we kind of chat with um, our friends, uh, friends of the show, and, and different fans and stuff like that. And we asked them. We said, "Hey, you know, we're going to have Josh on to talk about his music." And uh, so a lot of people actually asked. Um, questions and we kind of worked those into the show and so we want to say a big thanks to F Talo uh, Electric Boogaloo, Sotanga, Norm and you love Travis so we want to say thank you guys for your contributions to help make this episode Mm -hmm. a little bit better Um, if you're new to the podcast you can check out some of our past stuff so we have 99 episodes prior to this uh, a lot of different content and if you're interested in some of our more recent stuff uh, we recently did. I'm drawing a blank here. Well, there's been like Cuphead and oh. Wonder Boy were oh, two yeah. big ones that you know were also like Crash has had you know re-releases and or Cuphead was new, but um, but then there's other great like uh, mascot style games like Restar and or Big uh, Bang Pro Wrestling that was pretty recent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So a lot of great stuff. You know, again, if you um, if you want to know more about the show, online is the the best way. You can always get in touch with us on Discord. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we will see you back in a few weeks for the next episode. There's a track called Not Pirate. <laughs> <laughs> There's a track called Not Pirate. I love it. Not Pirate. Oh, I know what that is. That's the Making Waves demo. Josh, again, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, hey. it's been a real pleasure having you on. Thanks yeah. for having me. Congratulations on the 100th episode. <laughs>